Good morning, everyone. Come on in. Let's find our seats. We are going to get started. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so good to see all of you here in spite of the rain and the wet. Um, you found your way and we're so excited. You can uh, shake off a little bit. Just don't get your neighbors wet as you shake off that rain this morning. We have such a great session planned today and I am so excited to uh, get to welcome you all here today. My name is Brian Buford and I am the executive director of the LGBT Center at UofL and assistant provost for diversity. And this is our third LGBT Health Summit. So we are so excited to have you here today. Um, great speakers, great, uh, great content planned this morning. And so uh, we're just so happy that you're here. So I want to tell those of you who are new to our campus or maybe not familiar with the LGBT Center that we are celebrating 10 years this year of uh, existence at the University of Louisville as an LGBT Center. Thank you so much. We're so proud. Look at the slide just synced perfectly with that. So we are so, uh, we're so honored. And what I want all of you to know and the message that we want to send our community is that the University of Louisville is deeply committed to being the most inclusive and welcoming university in the country. We take great pride in being able to offer some resources and services to our, our campus, our students, and our community that really are leading the nation. And certainly here at the Health Sciences Center, uh, UofL is the first in the nation to do some of the important work in training medical students, for example, in offering uh, resources and educational opportunities like this. We're the, the first in the country to do that. In fact, for the last three years, UofL has been named one of the best of the best by Campus Pride, which is a national index that measures inclusiveness on college campuses. And so we are one of the, the best of the best and the only school in the South named to that index. So we take a lot of pride in that. Um, I wanna say thank you to uh, so many people who are a part of this event. But first and foremost, this is our first year in partnering with Humana here in our community. And uh, this partnership has just really been a blessing to the center and to this series because um, it has allowed us to really take it to a, a higher level. So we really appreciate Humana, the resources that they have brought, the leadership, the collaboration, and we will hear from um, one of our friends from Humana in just a moment. I also want you all to just uh, join me in saying a word of thanks to the amazing people who work at the LGBT Center. Um, we have a passionate, deeply dedicated, hardworking team at the center. And I tell you, they, they make me proud every day. It's an honor to work with them. So most of them are doing that deeply committed work out there, making sure you get in here okay. But I wanna say uh, Lisa Gunterman, who's right here with the camera, uh, Katie, Stacy, Emily, and Aaron are all working really hard. And as you see and meet them today, be sure and thank them for the great effort that they have put into this event. Will you just join me in a round of applause for the, the LGBT Center? <laughs> thank you, thank you. They asked me to remind you, we really want your feedback on the day today. And so as you see those e evaluations, I think you've got them with you at this point. So as you step out um, at different points along the morning, you'll see red boxes by the doors and you can put your evaluations in those red boxes so that we can get that feedback and really improve uh, this summit for future years to come. So wonderful. We're so glad to get started here. And to help us start the morning, I mentioned that Humana is um, our title sponsor and our collaborator in this event. So I'm so really deeply pleased to welcome Eric Eaker from Humana to come and do our introductions. And he's here. Welcome. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Aker. I am a, a director at Humana, and um, we're very, very happy to be able to sponsor this morning's uh, event. Um, we are uh, representing 
here today, uh, the, the, the community of Louisville. And I have the honor of working with a team called the Bold Goal Team at Humana, where we work on a population health initiative to help the communities we serve be 20% healthier by 2020 by making it easy for people to achieve their best health. And that's a very inclusive, holistic, and local approach that we're taking. Um, I also um, am, am here representing the Humana Inclusion and Diversity Team. I am the co-chair of the LGBT Network Resource Group, also called Pride. Uh, very, very happy to start in that position this year and serving our LGBT associates at Humana. Um, but today we are very honored to welcome Dr. Brian Hurley. Dr. Brian Hurley is an addiction psychiatrist and the medical director for substance abuse related care integration at the Los Angeles County Health Agency, a role he originated within the second largest publicly funded health system in the country. Brian is an assistant professor of addiction medicine in the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, Department of Family Medicine, and distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Brian completed the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program at the University of California, Los Angeles, and was previously a UCLA Veterans Administration National Quality Scholar at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. He is a former board member of GLMA, also known as GLAMA, uh, Health Professionals Advancing LGBT Equality. He served in the American Medical Association House of Delegates and previously chaired the AMA LGBT Advisory Committee and is a former national president of the American Medical Student Association. So Dr. Hurley, thank you so much for coming back to Louisville um, and we look forward to your, your talk today. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Good morning, by the way. I'm just loading my presentation. So my name's Brian. I'm an addiction psychiatrist, and I have the privilege of supporting some of the most vulnerable patients in LA County served by the Los Angeles <laughs> County Department of Mental Health. I have no conflicts of interest to dis disclose, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. So uh, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, take a few questions, and then we have a panel. That's kind of my portion of the morning, and then there's uh, another speaker this afternoon. What I'm going to cover during our next 40 or so minutes together, I'm going to cover some definitions and concepts. I'm going to talk about substance use disorder treatment, also known as addiction treatment in general. I'm going to talk about minority stress and trauma a bit. And then I'm going to talk about an approach to seeking or to engaging LGBT individuals who are seeking addiction services. So that's what I have planned for the next 40 minutes, and I'm thrilled that you get to join me on the journey. Every person has um, these four components to the human experience. We all have a biological sex. We all have a gender identity. We all have a gender expression and we all have sexual orientation. And this does not matter whether you are gay, straight, cis, trans, we all have this. Many people don't necessarily need to think about it. That is, their assigned sex at birth matches a cisgender identity, matches a heterosexual identity, and culturally, those things are normative, and so you don't necessarily think about um, th that you have a sex or a sexual orientation or gender identity. But these are our, all four orthogonally related components. What does that mean? That means that the sex you're assigned at birth does not necessarily dictate what your gender identity is, which does not dictate what your gender expression is, which doesn't have any bearing necessarily on your sexual orientation. So with this framework, I want to talk about the gingerbread person. The gingerbread person has a gender identity, right? Somewhere between you know, man, woman, or gender queer potentially in the middle, and a gender expression between things that are masculine, potentially feminine, or uh, somewhere in between. Um, biological sex between sort of male and female, and um, uh, there's lots of terms that are oftentimes used uh, related to people who don't identify as male or female. Sometimes it's androgynous. Um, there have been, uh, the term intersex has been proposed. Uh, the term that I use is difference of sex development, um, just because, you know, you can have uh, sex development in some ways that's atypical. And sexual orientation, heterosexual, uh, uh, gay, or bisexual. Okay, 
So biological sex, it can actually be determined by a number of different factors. I could give an entire lecture just on sex development, but suffice it to say that we have chromosomes that oftentimes but not always match up with the, the way external genitalia develop. And the way that sex is typically assigned at birth is that the baby's born, the obstetrician looks at the genitals, and that's it. That's the, tip, that's the typical process. Um, and if the, the obstetrician looks at the genitals and can't tell, or there's, um, in, in some ways, uh, sex development is atypical, it's uh, usually called a difference of sex development. Um, so that's sex development. Now, sexual orientation refers to a sexual attraction or arousal either to a particular body type or identity. And actually, uh, we think of heterosexual, uh, homosexuality, and bisexuality as sort of common forms of uh, sexual orientation. There's also some sexual orientations that have been identified and are listed in the DSM as pathologies, so fetishisms or paraphilias. And um, these are distinct from sexual orientation identity terms. So there are people that actually identify as gay, straight, bisexual, lesbian, and the terms like homosexual or heterosexual generally are not identity terms. Those refer, refer to sexuality, but not necessarily how people identify in the world. Um, so to, uh, I, this is the construct that I use, is the components of sexual orientation include your sexual identity, that is how you label your sexual orientation, it could be gay, straight, bisexual, or other. Um, your sexual behavior, what you do sexually with other people. And then your sexual attraction. And so there are people, for example, that identify their sexual identity as straight. And their sexual attraction might be to people of different sexes. And their sexual behavior might be full abstinence. They may not have um, uh, sexual relations with other people, right? So those are people where you don't always get a perfect congruence between how one identifies one's actual attraction and then one's behavior. So there are, for example, straight men who have sex with other men that don't identify necessarily as gay or bisexual, um, that their behavior doesn't necessarily match their identity. Um, but those are sort of the components we think of, of, of sexual orientation. So gender identity is distinct from sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is related to attraction. Gender identity has to do with one's internal sense of gender. That's the experience, whoop, the experience of one's own gender. And it can correlate with the assigned sex at birth. It's generally called cisgender people. Um, but it can differ from it. And that generally refers to people who identify as transgender. And there are culturally established gender categories that usually serve as the basis for the formation of somebody's identity. So um, in the United States and in most Western cultures, we have a binary between male and female. Now, that doesn't mean that those are the only two options, but culturally, those are the sort of the normative two genders. Um, not every culture has followed that, right? So I know in Native American culture, there's been sort of people who identify as two-spirit, who, um, it, which is a gender identity that's neither male or female, but is sort of a, a, a distinct category. And I do want to talk a bit about gender transition. It's sort of, it's early to jump into this, but um, I want to be clear about what we mean. When there are people whose internal sense of gender does not match uh, the, uh, the gender that they were assigned at birth, or the sex that they were assigned at birth, um, there are people who may choose to undergo what's called gender transition. Gender transition typically refers to the process where somebody makes a change in their gender expression or in um, actual, their, uh, uh, m uses medical procedures to adjust their physiology or anatomy in order to comport their own bodies with their internal sense of gender. And uh, I know that this is small, so I'm not going to, you know, torture you by reading all of it. But I do want to say, for some people, there's a self-awareness or a, a self-realization that there's uh, a difference between the, the gender that they were assigned at birth and their internal sense of gender. Um, and oftentimes, but not always, it can be helpful for somebody who, um, who's in, you know, who may identify as transgender to get some support around that. Now, I'm a psychiatrist. It's sort of easy for me to say that. Oh, you should go get support. But I will point out that um, seeking assistance from a mental health professional can be an important part of uh, transition. It's not mandatory, right? It's not that, that being transgender requires some special treatment. Um, but I do think that it can be helpful, particularly if people want to navigate like the Hello? medical treatment world to be able to like coordinate referrals and get um, letters can I call to you right back transition. 
Um, and then some people sort of stop there. They realize that their uh, gender identity okay. is transgender. Sorry, I'm in the middle of trying to fix something. And, that's kind of, and, and they realize that, but that's right. all that they right. sort of choose to do about it. But over some time frame, there are people that then choose to change their appearance and their gender expression to coincide with their internal sense of gender. And for some people, that might involve clothing changes, that might involve hairstyling changes, that might involve makeup changes. Um, and, and for some people, it involves none of those things. But that there is some change in their appearance and expression to coincide with their internal sense. Um, and uh, oftentimes, you know, sort of concurrent with this, there's a coming out process. What do we mean by coming out? Coming out's when somebody generally shares their internal experience with the world. Um, it is, for most people, a lifelong process. Um, I think of coming out, uh, so I, uh, just full disclosure, identify as a he, him, and his. I am a cisgender gay man. And I um, was going to be in Louisville this week, so I uh, needed to buy flowers for my husband because, you know, I wasn't going to be there for Valentine's Day. And so, um, and so I went to the flower shop and I bought flowers, and uh, the flower shop person said, oh, don't worry, these are going to be so lovely for your wife. I thought, ah, this is a chance to come out again, right? Um, uh, uh, and, and, and people who are um, uh, identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender oftentimes are in the position of coming out on a continual basis. And it kind of depends on a situation, like there are some people um, who don't necessarily uh, um, by virtue of their gender expression, don't necessarily need to come out. That, 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 that is, um, so there are people who sometimes just make it clear by virtue of their gender expression what their um, gender identity or sexual orientation is, but it really depends. And so point is, is that for many people, there's a coming out process that coincides with a change process around one's gender expression. And for many people, that concludes their transition. Now, there are some people that then get referred from mental health for hormone therapy, on gender affirming hormone therapy or gender affirming procedures. And there's a whole, again, we could probably give a whole talk just about gender transition. But I put this slide up um, as a way of uh, illustrating that for people with transgender gender identities, oftentimes there is a process associated. It, um, and the process involves an internal process. For some people, an actual sort of externalized change process and, uh, and usually a coming out process. Okay. Um, just uh, so that everyone knows, there is a, a guidebook to gender transition. It's called the World Professional Association on Transgender Health Standards of Care. Their latest standards were published in 2011. Um, this is the link. Anyway. Um, and the University of Louisville uh, D Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry um, supports uh, youth that are uh, exploring their gender identity and transition in accordance with those standards of care. Um, the experience related to uh, uh, having a minority status can be quite stressful. Um, and uh, that's true sort of regardless whether you're talking about people um, of non-majority religious affiliation, whether you're talking about people with different abilities or ableism, you're talking about people with different age groups, but minority status can be stressful. And what we find is for people with the transgender identity, that is the interpersonal trauma, the inner sort of discord between somebody's experience of themselves and between the gender role in which they were assigned, tends to be highest um, before any transition process and improves really throughout the transition process. But the, the interpersonal, so the intrapsychic process during transition tends to get a lot better. Um, but the interpersonal process, the sort of um, discrimination um, and, uh, frankly, violence that is sometimes enacted against transgender people tends to peak in the middle of a transition process when people are still solidifying their presentation and their, <clears throat> and their externalized identities. And that we find that as people stabilize in their lives, as people sort of uh, are, you know, uh, eventually sort of craft um, they're uh, living according to sort of authentically to their internal sense of self that we find that the interpersonal trauma eventually goes down. Um, but kind of in the middle, you get all kinds of stuff where people misgender people. There's all these like bathroom bills that get created. I mean, there's all these sort of, you know, interpersonal traumas that that uh, that, that are created um, that oftentimes peak as people in the middle of their transition process. Point is, is um, that gender transition can be life changing and hugely affirming of mental health for transgender people. 
and that the trauma sort of related to that improves inter, uh, in, uh, intrapsychically throughout or interpersonally, um, intrapersonally, but interpersonally uh, we do see sort of a peak. Um, gender identity is not determined by appearance or observed, observed, observed gender expression. And I was taking an English class in college and um, somebody uh, asked my professor, well, you know, how many transgender people, you know, have you run into on campus? Being like, there's basically there's no transgender people here. And he says, well, how, how would I know? Right? Um, I, I don't expect everybody that's transgender is necessarily going to come out, right? In the same way, I don't expect everyone that's LGBT to come out unless they're buying flour. Um, okay, that's a joke. Um, uh, gender expression. So I've mentioned gender identity, that is internal sense of self, and I sort of alluded to gender expression earlier, but gender expression really is um, whether or not do you conform with societal norms around the way that you're supposed to dress um, and the way that you're supposed to behave as somebody of a certain gender. So I, um, I, I, I would say that I'm comporting right now wearing a suit with a lavalier and you know belt and these shoes with stereotypical masculine sort of uh, gender expression. The way my hair looks, um, the way that I've shaved, I mean this is the kind of standard, uh, I, I would say relatively normative uh, male gender expression. If I was up here saying drag, six inch heels, big dress, huge wig, and lots of makeup, you would say this is somebody with um, who might be gender non-conforming, right? I'm still male. I don't, I, I don't identify as something other than male. Um, but uh, as one example, there are people in the drag queen community who, whose gender identity is generally a, a, a still you know, cisgender male, but whose gender expression might be very different than cultural norms around that. Um, and so as a way of illustrating this, so you can have a masculine gender identity that is, you can say that I'm a man, um, and that a masculine gender expression, and then you would so, say that, that person's gender conforming. But you can have a masculine gender identity, but have a feminine gender expression, and then be gender non-conforming. And then if you say, well, I don't buy the gender binary at all, like that's not something, I don't, I don't do, you know, I, I'm not sort of a binary thinker, then, um, in my gender expression, you might be somebody that, at least in this schematic, we label androgynous, somebody that doesn't necessarily fit culturally norms around gendered expression or behavior. And then sort of same thing with um, uh, people who don't identify necessarily with the masculine or feminine gender identity, who say I'm non-binary, I'm genderqueer. There's all kinds of terms that are oftentimes used for people that sort of reject identities as either male or female. And so this is uh, a, a screenshot of a music video by a uh, the lead singer of Rilo Kylie, who um, she herself identifies as female, but in the course of the video has a whole number of different gender expressions that, that range between what we think of as uh, culturally feminine and culturally masculine gender expressions. Um, and as a way of sort of illustrating the differences you see in gender expression. So I want to actually, I introduced the gingerbread person 1.0, but actually I think um, a better model is the gingerbread person 2.0 which does not posit that male and femaleness are binary or some, in any ways opposite to each other, because they're not. And so you can actually have a gender identity that has varying degrees of maleness or, or womanness, and there are people who say, I actually am non-gendered. Um, and so this doesn't then create, instead of there being an axis with two poles, and there's some way opposed, you actually have an axis where those things are orthogonally related. And so same thing with gender expression. There are people, so um, I've seen, uh, I have friends actually, who, um, have very masculine components to their gender expression um, in terms of the way that their bodies are, their, the, the way that their hair is, but when they dress and drag have very both masculine and feminine components to the way that they're doing their gender expression, at least at that particular time, as opposed to people who are agender, right? That, that don't identify or their, their gender expression is relatively neutral and, and free of what we think of as masculinizing or feminizing components. Um, and so uh, biological sex can include varying degrees of maleness and femaleness, and attraction can go from asexual to being attracted to men, being attracted to women, being attracted to women you know, uh, in, uh, uh, around companionship and men around sex activities. I mean, there's all sorts of components of sexual orientation that we could get into. But this, I think, is sort of a more nuanced understanding than trying to say that somehow male and female are on opposite sides of the poles. And then just other terms we should be aware of is there's a term ally that's oftentimes used. Ally refers to cisgender or heterosexual people who support um, uh, sexual and gender diversity. And then, uh, so the term LGBT gets thrown around. That refers to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. 
LGB or sexual orientation identity terms, transgender is a gender identity term, but that's an, a term that's oftentimes used. Um, I tried to find the longest acronym that I could um, to, to, to sort of illustrate that there's other, that there's other acronyms. And so um, LGBTTIQQ2SA stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Transsexual, Intersex, Queer, Questioning, Two-Spirit, and Allies, right? Um, and, and so it, uh, as you can tell, I don't know if it's, I've made it obvious so far, but the terminology around these terms can be quite messy. And I've used the term intersex here. Intersex is actually not um, a, a universally established term. So what do I mean by that? Well, the Intersex Society of North America is a group devoted to addressing um, uh, differences of sex development and trying to support um, uh, deferring any surgical modification of atypical genitalia, um, unless there's sort of a medical necessity around a managing malignancy risk. Um, until somebody is old enough in order to be able to choose such uh, any such procedures for themselves. Um, but intersex is sometimes also used by people who say, I don't identify as man or woman, I identify as somewhere in between. And it has nothing to do with genitalia development. It has everything to do with just, you know, uh, somebody rejecting a gender binary. And so um, what I oftentimes do in cases where somebody is using a term is uh, I provide, uh, I sort of, gently inquire, so what do you mean by that? Okay, so you identify, like, um, what is being, so I, I, I uh, put two-spirited up here. I think I know what two-spirited means, but if I'm talking to somebody, what do they think that it means? So sort of just be open and, and uh, have a bit of humility around terms that people use in all kinds of different ways. Okay, so how many LGBT people are there? Sort of depends on how you count. Um, oftentimes there, there, there is uh, a, a, when I was in college, there was sort of like a, a a culturally assumed number of like one in 10, um, but actually it's probably less than that, somewhere between 2.2% and 5.6%, uh, kind of depending on who's counting at the time. Um, the last number that I looked at a, from a population-based survey was somewhere around 3.5%, but we do know that um, the terms sort of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender are themselves culturally defined. And so therefore, different generations of people have different cultural notions related to what those terms mean. Um, we know that 0.6% of adults in the United States, or about 1.4 million people, identify as transgender. And we see that it's actually much higher in um, younger generations than in older generations. So there's a generational effect around um, people's identification with being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Now, uh, Louisville actually ranks as the 11th um, among major U.S. cities for uh, hosting LGBT populations. Um, so there it is, uh, you know, somewhere between um, Hartford and Virginia Beach. Um, and actually, if you sort of look at the, the percentage, you know, so San Francisco's at the top at 6.2, but it's, it's, and, you know, L.A. where I live is a 4.6, but Louisville is like right there. I mean, you know, it, within, I would say, a percentage, certainly within a percentage point of um, cities uh, like Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Denver, Boston, um, so I, I, you know, I think of, of, of Louisville as having a, a really important cultural impact um, in this part of the country. So uh, I mentioned that being LGBT can be stressful, and so I want to sort of uh, put up, and this is, you know, again, we could spend a whole 40 minutes just on the minority stress model, but there's this idea that you have circumstances in the environment that um, interact with minority sta status or intersect with minority status to create a minority stress process that includes prejudice events, as well as expectations of rejection, concealment, and internalized homophobia or transphobia or internalized isms um, that compound with general stressors that can lead to um, mental health outcomes that can be negative or positive. And the mediators of whether or not a stressful event uh, leads to a mental health outcome depends on um, various characteristics of minority identity and a number of resiliency factors. So that's a really complicated way of saying this next slide, which is social support, emotional openness, openness and uh, hope and optimism can create a lower reactivity to prejudice and support psychological health. And people that have poor social supports um, uh, uh, that are not particularly emotionally open and who are not particularly strongly future oriented, people who have like an external locus of control who do a lot of externalizing, um, oftentimes uh, have a higher reactivity to prejudice and it can lead to poorer psychological health. Does that kind of make sense? All right. 
Um, so as a way of sort of illustrating this, we know among people who identify as gender nonconforming, and I mentioned younger generations um, ha uh, uh, have an increasing, uh, are increasingly more likely to identify as LGB or T, um, but overall, uh, in this California population-based survey, 17% of the youth between the ages of 12 and 17 um, identified as uh, gender nonconforming in this particular sample and had a significantly higher rate of severe psychological distress compared to people who were gender conforming. Um, there are other population-based survey, and I, I do want to sort of talk about addiction services. Now we've gone through identity terms and, 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 uh, and demo, uh, demographics and what we know about sort of numbers to talk about what do we know about substance use disorders? So the NISAR, the National Epidemiologic Survey of Alcohol and Related Conditions, um, long national survey looking at a whole number of substance use and men mental health indicators, found that the odds of developing a substance use disorder compared to people who were straight. Um, for uh, lesbian women, it was three times as likely to have alcohol use disorder, 11.3% um, uh, more likely to have cannabis use disorder, and 14% um, uh, uh, more likely to have, uh, or not 14%, 14, 14 times more likely to have uh, substance use disorder. And for bisexual women, you also see sort of elevated rates of alcohol use disorder, cannabis, and other substance use. And then for, uh, for gay men, it was about three times for alcohol use disorder, 4.4 for cannabis use disorder. Um, but you see sort of dramatically increased risks related to substance use, which is not because being LGB or T is somehow intrinsically associated with substance use, but because the minority stress experienced by people who are LGB or T in the context of the world oftentimes creates an opportunity for people to use substances as a solution. And for people to use substances, at least in my experience as an addiction psychiatrist, people use substances as a solution to a problem. And that substance then becomes its own problem, right? So you have to then address the problem that was the solution to the problem to, to sort of begin with. For tobacco, there's elevated prevalence of smoking in LGBT population, or LGB populations. This uh, sample did not include trans folks. Um, between 1.5 and 2.5 percent. And so I, I've mentioned now um, what we know about lesbian women, bisexual women, gay men, and bisexual men. And I've talked a little bit about uh, LGB folks, but what about trans people? Well, na the NISARC survey did not ask questions about gender identity. So we don't have any information about gender identity from that particular uh, epidemiologic survey. So what we have from trans people are generally convenient samples in, that are not national. They tend to be localized convenient samples. And as a result, um, uh, it limits the generalizability. So I'll present what we do know about you know, the substance use in transgender populations, but sort of take these with a grain of salt because the generalability of this information may not necessarily be fully generalizable here to, to Louisville, Kentucky. So the New York Transgender Project I looked at self-reported prevalence of substance use among the prior six months among um, uh, trans women that found heavy alcohol use, high uh, marijuana use, cocaine stimulant, and opiate use. Um, biological assays of non-alcohol substances were um, uh, uh, approximately 10% or less. Um, there was a 2014 study of individuals entering addiction treatment in publicly funded um, uh, programs in San Francisco. We do know that among the 14 or so thousands admitted between 2007 and 2009, um, they did ask questions about gender and sexual orientation. Oh. And a significant portion of the transgender treatment seekers declined to answer when they were queried about gender. Transgender women were over the six times as likely to be seeking treatment for methamphetamine use, um, but there were no difference in the primary substance for which transgender and cisgender people sought treatment. So you can imagine if you're asking a sample of people seeking substance use, virtually all of those people are going to report substance use. So this is not a useful measure for seeing what's the overall prevalence of substance use, but can give you some idea of what do we know about the people that are substance uh, treatment seeking. And so we do know that oftentimes transgender people decline to answer questions about gender, probably because they, they're worried if it's safe to do so. Um, and uh, that we saw trans women more likely to seek treatment for methamphetamine use. Transgender individuals were more likely than cisgender to ever have a psychiatric diagnosis or have been to be prescribed a psychiatric medication. A meta-analysis looking at 18 studies on um, uh, substance use disorders in LGBT youth, th there was a higher odds of substance use in this population. Um, it was uh, almost twice of what we saw for heterosexual youth, 
um, uh, over three times as likely for bisexual youth and four times higher for uh, women who identify as LGB or T. And that was corroborated by similar trends in other sort of parts of the world. Um, so, so that's kind of what we know, which I, I sort of have to say is not much. I actually think that there's a whole like imperative for good epidemiologic research around LGBT populations, particularly T populations, like transgender people, that we just don't have. Um, and there's, again, a whole number of convenient samples looking at people who are transgender to sort of self-report, but that is very different than what we would be able to accomplish if we had um, gender identity questions embedded into large national surveys where you could actually get a good epidemiologic report on what is the actual prevalence. Okay. so. That's what we know so far. There, are, there was a survey looking at substance use treatment programs in the United States. And 11.8%, this was a survey of all treatment programs sort of um, known to the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. And 11.8% um, say, we offer LGBT-specific services. So then the investigators actually uh, looked into what are is the treatment that you offer. If you say you offer LGBT-responsive services or specific services, what do you offer? And of that 11.8%, 70.8% were no different than what is offered in uh, just general population substance abuse treatment programs. Um, there is the perception of significant barriers to accessing treatment. So I mentioned in the San Francisco study, um, treatment seekers declined to answer questions about gender. My hypothesis, because there were safety issues around that. I wonder if it's safe to do that. And so there's a perception um, uh, that there is, again, a significant barrier to accessing treatment. So we know that in programs that do have bona fide LGBT services, LGBT um, clients are more likely to engage in treatment that addresses issues of gender and sexuality. Um, there's less compliance, as you can imagine, uh, to treatment that are recommended by people who are overtly homophobic or transphobic, and accessible treatment for transgender people is uh, uh, particularly lacking. So. What, uh, I, I imagine many people in the room sort of know what I'm talking about when I talk about addiction treatment, but let me just be clear. Um, when I'm talking about addiction treatment, I'm talking about the treatment that is focused on um, reducing or creating abstinence or recovery from substance use and um, recognizing that substance use is oftentimes a tool that people use to address some problem that they're having, and then that tool then became itself a problem. So you have to address the substance use, but I think good addiction treatment then also needs to look at what were the reasons that you were using in the first place and how do you address those. Um, so there's a variety of psychotherapies that have been validated. So SAMHSA lists 12-step um, facilitation and, and uh, peer treatment, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy, community reinforcement, contingency management, multisystemic therapy, and multisystemic family therapy, all are, are multidimensional family therapies, all being well validated evidence based approaches. There's also medications for addiction treatment, but not all uh, substances respond to medications. So, alcohol, opioid, and tobacco use disorders all have medications that can impact substance use, but there is no medication that has been FDA approved for cannabis use disorder, amphetamine use disorder, cocaine use disorder, um, hallucinogen use disorder. Those are the, the substance use disorders for which there are medication targets. Um, and so when I conceptualize addiction treatment, I think um, you need uh, therapy and psychotherapy or counseling can be very helpful with skills. Right? How do you teach somebody how to tolerate their lives in a world uh, without substance use? Those of you in the treatment community will probably know what I mean when I say live life on life's terms. Right? How do you live life on life's terms? Um, I also think a component of addiction treatment needs to be support. And support is different than counseling. Counseling is about skills. Support is about what is the milieu, the people, places, and things with whom you interact on a daily basis. Now, you need skills in order to be able to navigate those things, the people, places, and things that you navigate on a daily basis. But who do you have to call when things aren't going well? Do you have a sponsor? Do you have a group that you go to? And for some people, their treatment is support. They go to meetings. They connect with other people. Maybe they work some steps. Some steps then may teach somebody some skills, but support might be the major ingredient for some people. And medications, I think, also have a very important role to play in supporting people with uh, alcohol, tobacco, and uh, opioid use disorders. Um, particularly for opioid use disorders, medications can be very strongly effective. So for, for patients that I see, and you know, I'm an addiction psychiatrist, so I see patients, um, I want to make all three of those a component of somebody's treatment. And I think if I don't offer somebody the full range of options, I'm not doing my job. 
So how is this relevant for LGBT folks? Well, for LGBT folks in particular, I would say support is paramount. You want to be sure that people have the support in order to lead a healthful life. That you're giving somebody skills, that the skills, the steps, and the therapies aren't necessarily different for LGBT folks than they are for other folks, but the context, the sort of set and the setting in which those skills are learned does need to be attuned to people who, um, to the people's uh, real life context. And then the medications do not work differently for LGBT people than other people. We all have roughly equivalent physiology. Okay, so what do we know about treatment in LGBT populations? Interestingly, studies have not found a significant difference between LGBT-specific treatment and general treatment for LGBT people. So um, this guy, Steve Shapta, he's in Los Angeles, has done a lot of research um, trying to show a difference in um, LGBT-specific treatment for methamphetamine use disorder for gay men. And he published in 2005 a study of 162 methamphetamine-dependent um, or this was in, you know, this was before the DSM was published, so the DSM-5 was published, so it was called methamphetamine dependence. We would call it amphetamine use disorder now. Looking at um, CBT, consistency management, combined CBT with consistency management and culturally tailored gay-specific treatment. All groups got better, but there was no difference or improvement around the gay-specific treatment um, as compared with the uh, other treatment modalities. And another study, also published by Steve Shapta in 2008, compared gay-specific treatment um, to, uh, and gay-specific social service uh, uh, therapy in a community health clinic, and both groups showed significant reductions in, the great, uh, in their rates of alcohol and drug use at the end of the 16-week study. Um, and there was durability at one-year uh, follow-up. And then Morganson compared MI with CBT in a group of 188 men who have sex with men with alcohol use disorder. Again, both therapy types led to decreases in drinking. So it tells me that general treatment can be effective for LGBT people. And we haven't, although there's great anecdotal evidence that LGBT people um, seek treatment in LGBT specific programs um, more than in non-LGBT specific programs, the actual treatment itself, once it's delivered, can be effective, even if it's not necessarily gay tailored or gay specific. Um, so from my perspective, the outcomes of these studies suggest that LGBT affirming programs don't necessarily need to have a lot of fancy LGBT specific stuff in them, as long as um, the clinicians involved, in my view, are reasonably free of homophobia, transphobia, and heterosexism. That's really important. Like if you're if you're running a program, you don't necessarily. I mean, there is a role for LGBT specific programming, and I'll sort of get into that. But the floor, what I would expect every program to be able to do, is have clinicians reasonably free from the isms that drive people out of treatment. Right? Be reasonably free of again tra homophobia, transphobia, heterosexism that leads to people who are LGBT dropping out of treatment to have generally positive regard for our patients, to welcome and promote openness about sexual orientation and gender identity in the therapeutic setting, and be familiar with many of the issues commonly faced by LGBT people. I think if we were to inculcate this list in treatment in general, it would make a transformative impact on LGBT communities being able to access LGBT treatment. That said, LGBT programs I do think have a role. Um, LGBT specific groups or LGBT specific programs and their role in my view is when people's substance use is tied to struggles with coming out, um, is tied to difficulty talking about one's personal life, is tied to inner conflict around sexual orientation or gender identity and is a significant factor affecting their substance use. Um, people who have been traumatized and their trauma is due to homophobic or transphobic attacks and for people who drug-associated activities, such as compulsive sex with methamphetamine, may be difficult to discuss in a general population setting. In these settings, I think it makes sense for there to be protected um, affinity space for LGBT people to be able to address their substance use. Um, but if you are, and I sort of, I mean no offense when I say this, but if you're like uh, an out lesbian woman that's been out forever and you drink a lot of alcohol and your alcohol use is not necessarily related to like your specific sexuality, but is related to sort of general life stressors, in my view, you don't necessarily need to send that person to a sort of segregated or specific group just because she's lesbian, right? Um, I think it really depends on what is the drive for the substance use. Is it specific um, to somebody's LGBT identity? And would it be difficult to address in the context of general treatment? So I support there being LGBT specific programs, but I do not think that the only place that an LGBT person can do well is an LGBT specific program. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So I want to talk about a case of a 32-year-old patient 
named George, or client. I'm a doctor, so I say patient, and I mean no, I, I try not, to, I'm not being paternalistic. It's a term that I learned. Um, but, uh, but individual, 32-year-old individual walks into a treatment program seeking addiction treatment. What sexual orientation or gender-related information would be useful to know about Jordan? What do you guys think? What did you say? Pronouns, yeah. So it'd be useful to know information about the, their gender, their gender identity, gender, uh, gender expression, and in some cases, it's useful to know about sexual orientation and sexual, uh, uh, sexual um, practices, but at the very least, no pronouns. I think that that would be useful to know. Um, so there's a whole push for pronouns now. That um, part, when somebody walks into your office, one of the things that you ask is, um, what pronouns would you like me to use? So I started this presentation talking about um, I identify as he, him, and his. And an alternative would be she, her, or hers. But there's a whole number of other pronouns that actually people can identify with. So um, Webster's has changed they, them, and theirs from being a plural pronoun, referring to groups of people, to actually being a singular pronoun for people that don't identify as a he or a her. Um, so they, them, and theirs. And then there's all kinds of other variations like A, M, and air, V, V, and V's, Z, them, and theirs. Um, I mean, I could sort of go on. But there's a whole number of pronouns that people might want to use. It can be challenging. It's challenging for me when somebody identifies as a them, or I'll just be real honest, as a them, a them, or a Z, or something other than he or her. But if somebody identifies that way, and that's the way they want to be referred to, it does not, it's no skin off my back from my perspective, to address people how they want to be addressed, right? I don't, um, there are all sorts of cases where healthcare providers take this stance of, um, I need to address you by your biological sex. Why? There's absolutely no reason to address somebody anything other than they want to be addressed. It would be like if somebody said, uh, hi, my name is Michael, and I was like, hey, John, why, why am I calling them John? It just like they, they've told me that their name is Michael. Um, okay, so there's a, a New York Times article on sort of uh, who's they, witnessing a great explosion in the way human beings are allowed to express our gender identities. Um, we've always been, again, allowed, but I think there's now a cultural relaxation over um, uh, uh, what is sort of uh, culturally normative around um, expressing gender. So if Jordan looked like this, what pronoun would you use? Might be tough, it might be tough, right? You might need to ask. What if Jordan looked like this? Or what if Jordan looked like this? Right? Port, port, uh, the point is, it's important to ask. And then how would you collect sexual orientation or gender identity, or uh, for those of you that write in this field, SOGI, um, how would you uh, 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 collect sexual orientation or gender identity data? Where would you put it? Biopsychosocial, yeah, absolutely. So um, oftentimes it's collected on intake survey or during a biopsychosocial assessment, oftentimes asked during the visit. Um, I, I'll tell you what I do, which is I put pronouns as part of identifying information. I put it where I put next to their name, um, next to their date of birth, next to their addresses. I sort of put the pronouns just right there because it's, it's just sort of part of somebody's identity. Um, their uh, sexual orientation uh, might go under uh, actually social history. And then if they have a difference of sex development, that kind of goes under medical history. So it kind of, it sort of depends on what I'm collecting, the, the sort of where, where I put it. And usually I record it in the electronic health record. Um, substance use records are protected under um, both HIPAA, the Health Information and Portability Accountability Act, and under 42 CFR Part 2, which um, provides extra protection for the privacy of those records. Um, here is a sample set of questions that you can use in order to collect information about sexual orientation and gender identity. What sex were you assigned at birth? Um, male, female, you can include other. Um, most people aren't assigned an other, but I guess you could include it. Um, what's your current gender identity? Male, female, um, trans male, trans man, trans woman, gender career, gender not conforming, or uh, you, I always recommend including like an other field because there, are, as I mentioned, the terminology around this is not solidified and people use all kinds of different terms. Um, how do you self-identify as bisexual, gay, les, uh, lesbian, or heterosexual? Um, and I mentioned pronouns. Uh, if I was to include pronouns, I would include just a field for people to write it in um, rather than necessarily a him or a she, right? But you, I, would, I would have a field where people would be able to put in their pronouns. And then I always have this field. If, uh, if one of the above does not best describe you, please answer the following. 
Um, I don't ask about sexual practices on a forum. I just think that's weird. Um, but uh, if it comes up, but, but, and, and oftentimes I don't necessarily need to ask about sexual practices unless somebody brings it up in the context of the psychosocial, psychosocial interview. Point is, you can't necessarily make assumptions about what sexual practices somebody does based on their sexual orientation and certainly not based on their gender identity. Um, but there are cases where it's important to ask particularly gay men um, who come in with methamphetamine use disorder, a lot of times methamphetamine really is a important part of their sexual practices. And being able to address the sex and love addiction component that oftentimes co-occurs with amphetamine use disorder is really important to know. So it's not that sexual practices aren't relevant. Oftentimes they are, but they're oftentimes collected in the context of somebody's substance use disorder history, not as part of like an identity piece. Um, Health and Human Services has made sexual orientation and gender identity part of meaningful use. Um, and so Jordan reported drinking and smoking tobacco as a teenager, uh, uh, describing this as motivated by the desire to fill, fit in with peers. As a teenager, Jordan was uh, aware of same-sex attractions. Jordan reported a contentious relationship with their mother and moved out from their mother's house as a teenager. And people in, uh, in Jordan's shared house were experimenting with drugs and drinking a lot. And Jordan started to use MDMA, which is ecstasy, and cocaine in addiction to alcohol and tobacco. Um, you could do a sexual practices history to see to what extent does the cocaine and ecstasy use sort of uh, impact some uh, uh, their sexual behaviors. And then um, what else would you need to know? Well, sexual practice history. You know, do you have sex with when, women, both, anyone else? Who puts what where? Do you use barriers or contraceptives? Um, what has been your history of STDs or STD treatment? Um, uh, what has been the history of all these things over one's lifetime or over the past 12 months? But that, as I think of, is like a, a fast and loose back of the envelope sexual practices history. If you know this, this sort of this list of stuff, you're in a decent place and sort of knowing what. Um, about somebody's sort of sexual practices. And um, oftentimes you can link people to STD treatment if they haven't been treated. So we know in uh, the population of, uh, of LGBT patients that seek um, substance use disorder treatment, you can, you can have rates of STDs that it's really important to address. And I, I think that HIV and hepatitis treatment should be integrated into substance use disorder treatment. Um, so, you know, it supports comprehensive medical and psychosocial assessments in the context of substance use disorder treatment. And I think if you collect information in that way, you just lay it out. Hey, how do you identify, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, it's part of the intake. We're open to whatever identity or whatever um, uh, uh, gender identity or sexual orientation identity or whatever um, sexual practices information you're willing to share. Um, people will ultimately share a lot more if they feel like you're not judging and you're not creating heteronormative or cisnormative expectations. Um, there's a whole textbook on uh, uh, in, uh, international perspectives on addiction treatment that has an LGBT section. Um, SAMHSA has a provider's introduction to substance abuse treatment for LGBT individuals that I would encourage everyone here to check out. And um, I uh, helped with this guide with the Association of American Colleges, uh, Association of American Medical Colleges on implementing curricular and institutional climate changes to improve care for individuals who are LGBT, gender nonconforming, and or born with a difference of sex development. Because again, these are all orthogonally related and you might identify as LGB or T and or be gender conforming or non-conforming and or have a difference of sex development. Those are all again orthogonally related factors. So um, at this time, I, this is my email address. If there's questions that you want to ask um, to, to me directly without uh, benefit of the full audience. Um, and I have time for one question before we get to our panel. So what question does anybody have? Yes. The, the comment was that um, in the experience of this uh, audience participant, um, 
the, the ways of asking questions that were posited here are not uniformly done in treatment or even in primary care. And without a uniform way of actually assessing this information, we're left not knowing. So it's really important to ask the questions um, in the context of delivering health services. So actually, that's a great segue. And what I'd like to do now is bring up um, our panel of a uh, person with a patient experience, a counselor experience, and, and a kind of the organizational perspective. So if I could get Mandy, Michael, and Jennifer up to the stage, I'd uh, appreciate it. So um, while, while uh, Mandy, Michael, and Jennifer are coming up, um, so uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Mandy, Michael, and Jennifer to, um, uh, to introduce themselves. But just give me one second for some housekeeping. Um, uh, if we could grab the chairs, yeah. Awesome. You got it. So what I was thinking would make sense for the panel is um, for uh, uh, us to have uh, each person go for about seven minutes. My hope is that um, we can get introductions done between sort of 20 and 25 minutes and then have uh, lots of time for audience discussion. I was thinking it would make sense for um, Mandy to go first and then Michael and then Jennifer, you can round us out. Um, Mandy is here for the um, kind of patient or uh, client perspective. Um, Michael is here for the counselor perspective and Jennifer is here for the organizational perspective. So if it's okay, Mandy, can I ask you to introduce yourself and get us started? Okay. I'm Mandy Cunningham. I identify the trans woman. And um, uh, Michael? Uh, Michael Gosser, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a uh, licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. Been in the field for a little over 20 years uh, in institutional uh, work, uh, private, private practice a little bit, and then uh, a couple organizations. Jennifer Hancock, CEO of Volunteers of America. Good morning. Um, Mandy, would you feel comfortable getting us started by telling us a little bit more about your experience? Um, I, I think uh, your experience is pretty simple. Um, it was, uh, uh, I would think the states you know, um, around um, your relationship. That's fine. That's all. Really good. Does that work? Does work? Cool. Okay. I started out several years ago, um, looking for secret knowledge. I used to do my own HR. I used to get drugs out of Canada, and I realized how unsafe that was. So I started seeking treatment. I ended up with Dr. Porque, and he got me on HR. And I started having a lot of mental problems, and I ended up many a times in mental hospitals around the area not knowing what the outcome was going to be. I was surprised first time I was put in. They didn't put me with males, which made my healing process much better. Um, the other times I was put in the mental hospitals, again, I was treated with dignity. They didn't house me with males as they probably could have done. And it basically it's got me back to where I have trust in myself as well as the mental health professions around here. I've suffered mental abuse my whole life, emotional abuse, physical abuse. I attempted suicide several times. And um, again, I 
guess where I'm at mentally right now. I finally, I, I'm finally can hold a full time job, mm. thanks to the hospitals. So, Mandy, you um, you mentioned that uh, when um, you had been to the hospital, mm -hmm. that um, uh, where you were housed made a significant yes. difference. It, oh, it made a hundred percent difference. I mean, if they'd housed me with the male population. I probably would have never been back to the hospital mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't identify as a male. I don't. I identify myself more as a lesbian transgender woman, mm -hmm. not heterosexual. I just, I never felt comfortable around men and probably. If I'd have been housed with male population, I would have probably committed suicide when I got out. Because mm. I would have never went back. That's how... I'm lost. No, no, uh, I'm, uh, I'm lost. First off, I don't think you're lost. I think you're doing okay. great. Uh, second off, um, I, I think your experience speaks to the importance of being appropriately identified and not being misgendered. Yes, I was, even through my, uh, even through the medical, I mean, my doctors identified me, they used the correct pronouns, which is very important. I mean, Even today, it's like, I don't know how passable I am. <laughs> Seriously, I can go into the, a new doctor and it's like, they would like ask me, like, the last time I went to Norton's Audubon, it's like, well, Miss Cunningham, when did you have your last period? And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I like, I'm, Okay. She goes, have you had any surgeries? And it's like, yes, I did have one major surgery. Okay, we won't ask you that one no more. So I, I love that part. It made me feel really well. I think any time that you use the correct pronouns, it a big plus in my life, I know. What do you think the best way would be for a um, a clinic or a, a physician that you saw or uh, any any clinician that you saw to ask you about your pronouns? What, what, how have you seen that being done well? I have never been asked about my pronouns. I've always, when I went in, I they always miss. I. Uh, that's a big plus. I have, I've never been called Mister while in the going to see my doctors. I was never called Mister when I was in the mental health facilities. I was always referred to as Ma'am. Mm. And again, that's part of my treatment. Um, if I had been denied. To, those things in the medical profession, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I would still be probably, who knows, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't. And what, um, what advice might you offer uh, a clinic or a program that is looking to provide services to the, the LGBT communities? Um, what do you? What steps do you imagine they could take that would be supportive, given your experience? My advice is treat them as me as a trans woman. Treat me as a woman. Mm -hmm. Don't treat me no different than anyone else. If a trans male walked in, treat him as a regular male. It, that part of the healing process. 
Um, Um, uh, you mentioned that in your experience, you've had a couple of good experiences, right? Where you were uh, uh, housed in the appropriate place and where people referred to you with the appropriate pronouns. Um, it sounds like uh, you've had doctors that weren't always aware of your full medical history and were asking you questions that weren't necessarily uh, uh, appropriate to your medical history. Yes. Um, uh, do you have any uh, cautionary tales or any experiences you had where things didn't go well that you feel like would be helpful for people to know about? As far as my medical history, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always been treated with dignity and respect here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And You've always been treated with dignity and respect. I don't, in the medical profession, I have. Now, as far as my personal life, no. Okay. I mean, as far as my personal life, I've suffered physical abuse. Um, I've suffered emotional abuse. Um, and this is basically my physical and emotional abuse is what led me to be in housed in the mental hospital. Yeah. And. Is there anything else that uh, do you think people should know about when, when taking care of people in, uh, in LGBT communities here in Louisville? You mentioned dignity and respect and that being an important piece. I just wasn't sure if there was anything else that you felt like would be important. Um, actually, Other than just um, you know the correct pronouns, um, having us with the right population, that's the only thing. It's like mm -hmm. I've been housed and I've been treated with most respect here. Mm -hmm. I can't think of one thing that they did do didn't do right, um, but. I think they just need to keep up doing what they're doing right. Okay. I, mean, I have no, I have no problem. I got it. Treated with most respect, even though you know a person doesn't look like they're a male or is they a female. Just treat them as they, you know, treat them as they're supposed to be. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Michael, you want to go next? Sure, it's, and, <laughs> and we're to start. Just so many things came up from the, your discussion and things that I thought about as well. Yeah. So I made some notes, but one thing, don't assume. Uh, just ask what is your, you know, kind of thought. Um, we have policies in place. I mean, I, I brought, we have some, you know, policies on this or that or the other. Uh, one, non-discrimination, gender identity with patients. I work for Our Lady of Peace currently. But it's more than just having a policy in place. It's making sure that everyone follows that policy, is educated, is on the same page. Um, so uh, that was my statement on that. Uh, not just having buy-in, but training support for the entire staff. And I'm sorry if I'm jumping on some of your stuff as administratively. Uh, but from the first person that you know you talk with, and I'm not sure your thoughts on that front desk reception, you know, through the clinical interviews, treatment, et cetera. 
um, making sure everybody is on the same page has that support awareness and not just acceptance but like support mm -hmm. um, I'm not just here to I tolerate this because I have had the folks that I've interviewed uh, for therapist positions like well I really I'm not going to do couples therapy with someone who is a same-sex couple or otherwise I'm like you're really not going to fit very well here then uh, and looking at that that's you know I understand your personal perspective but that's probably not going to fit really well with our treatment approach and philosophy um, so just a lot of different things uh, making sure we have a safe space uh, making sure it's safe physically but also confidentiality and that we're you know uh, everything we're sharing is kept confidential understanding the limits of confidentiality uh, and then just it, you had mentioned kind of coming out and that process uh, I hadn't really thought about it, but it triggered memories like you come out when you do that initial kind of intake interview. You do it again when you're meeting with your therapist. Mm -hmm. And if you're in group, you do it again with group and it's kind of repeatedly coming out. So understand being aware of that and what that's like and not forcing that on somebody. It's like you need to come out. Well, maybe not because some, certain folks, they have come out in individual therapy with me. But then what we're going into group. It's like I'm not ready to do that. It's like you don't have to do that. That's up to you. And most of the time it happened if they were comfortable once they got connected with the group and established. But just thinking of those things that uh, we may not always think of and getting somebody's perspective on that, being non-judgmental, respectful, just good treatment. I mean, good, um, you know, if you're a clinician uh, and you're working with somebody, uh, the same kind of things apply. And I think some of the slides you talked about specific LGBT specific treatment or otherwise um, and applying those principles it doesn't necessarily have to be specific for that population, but making sure you're considering various things with that. Um, becoming familiar with LGBT culture, but that's, you know, that's great to do, at, you know, taking classes in grad school uh, on, on that, but also asking the person, what is your culture? What is, you know, your lifestyle like? Uh, help me understand you, not just something I reference book or my own experience, whether, you know, I, have, I had my own experience in coming out and uh, dealing with my life and who I am, but then somebody else may be very different from that. So not assuming just because I've been through this or I've taken a course or I've read a book uh, that I know. But it's also important to do that. You, you listed a lot of resources, uh, and I've, there's a lot of those that are here, you know, the same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some quick guides as well. But um, so that's a kind of initial thoughts. I don't know if there's any follow-up questions. I have a lot of thoughts on this, uh, but maybe, uh, kind of some direction on where to go. Yeah, maybe, maybe we could save it for the, for the dialogue with okay. the participants. You know, I think about from the organizational perspective, the importance of having some structural and foundational um, pieces in place in order to be able to have effective client services. And for me, that starts at the governing board of directors level, how we um, have rigorous processes in our employment practices to make sure to the greatest extent possible that we have a board and staff that are reflective of the community we wish, we wish to serve. At Volunteers of America, we have a very broad mission. We serve 23,000 people a year from seniors in housing, to homeless families, individuals and families dealing with addiction and HIV uh, services and solutions. And so when I think about the importance of this work and what we're here to talk about today, I can confess to you that in some areas of our organization, we are far superior than in other areas of our organization where we are still on a learning curve. Um, but certainly from the perspective of having um, a very thoughtful and deliberate process around who we recruit to our board and making sure that we have representatives of this community on our board. We have a member of our board here today, Dr. Kelly Dunn, and she can attest um, to the fact that we are very intentional to have a diverse board and from a leadership perspective, making sure that we're reflective of the community. Um, I also want to say that, that I loved your presentation. There was one word mm -hmm. um, that I bristled at, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just curious about this because what I heard you say is that we should be um, clinicians, and, and I guess I'll apply that to the organizational context, should be reasonably free mm -hmm. of homophobia. And that word reasonably um, kind of got in my way mm -hmm. thinking about our expectations organizationally because I don't know today in 2018 we would expect and accept to be reasonably free of other isms. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just noted that mm -hmm. and, and, and caught myself in reacting to that. At Volunteers of America, we have diversity. This is another structural component of how our organization has been built and designed. 
One of five core values has been identified by our board and staff long ago. We, there's thousands of values. Well, we distilled into five that we will all adhere to and honor every day. One of those five is diversity. And that for us is not just a word on a piece of paper or in many cases in our facilities, a, a word with an iconic figure, uh, Martin Luther King, in our program locations. That has been, all of those core values have been integrated into how we make hired, hiring decisions and how we evaluate performance. So every time our employees sit down with a supervisor to have a formal performance appraisal, um, there is an assessment regarding are you fulfilling the, the duties as outlined in your position description. There is also a component of the performance appraisal that is let's talk about how you're adhering and honoring these core values. So our baseline expectation is that people are free of bias mm -hmm. and able to honor and live out this value of diversity, which for us applies in many different ways in which we serve from age and, and racial and ethnic diversity, language diversity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would like to see organizations have a, a higher bar around mm -hmm. that, frankly. And I think that we aspire to do that and really lead by example by having some real practices in place that have some teeth in it, um, where our merit increase, for instance, is built around how we um, perform in our in our annual review. Mm. Would it be okay if you open it up for, sure. uh, for audience questions, reactions, and, uh, and comments? Yes. If it's okay, the question was so for the recording. Um, the the question was about um, what are your hiring practices and what are the the questions or the um, techniques you use to identify candidates and determine about their appropriateness or inappropriateness. The first, I, I, we uh, I refer back to our policies. Like we have various policies, so and and, and values as well. Uh, core values, reverence, integrity. You know whatever those are, but kind of tying them into that uh, is how I utilize that. It's like we have a you know a gender specific policy, uh, can you tell me any any trouble you may have with that or your perspective on how you would follow that policy, abide by that? This is the expectation, a, a non-discrimination policy. So can you share any concerns you may have with that policy uh, or being able to, you know, kind of uh, operationalize what that looks like, how, how you apply that to your personal perspective, as well as, you know, whether it's a social work code of ethics, et cetera, looking at those kind of that basis. Uh, and comparing how do you how do you respond to that? Are there any issues you may have with these approaches or policies? This is the, the culture we have here. Uh, any concerns you may have uh, fitting into that culture or uh, following through with uh, you know promoting that culture? I'll add to that. We use a lot of behavioral based interview questions. And so we might ask, give us an example of a time where you've been in an environment where um, you were working with people quite different from you and where did that push your boundaries and how did you manage that? Did you seek supervision around that? How did you learn from that? We're always looking for um, the, the skill of appreciative inquiry, being able to learn from people. And I loved your comments earlier, Michael, around that, not making assumptions that because we're a part of a community that we know all of those answers, but really digging into some questions that help us help the candidate reveal that they have that skill around appreciative inquiry and they have enough self-awareness to recognize when their boundaries are being pushed and how they manage that. And that's great because we did the same thing. We have a screening interview initially and asking some of those questions, then the behavioral health, behavioral interviewing questions with peer interviewing, you know, asking it from their perspective, kind of in a different different realm, a different way to ask that question or get their perspective or a specific situation where they dealt with that issue. Yes. The, com the, the comment was thanking uh, Mandy for her, uh, for her participation.
the, um, the question was uh, on behalf of organizations and institutions that have some authority and power and are in a position to, uh, to train people, um, what do we do when it appears that the, the floor that I mentioned, the, uh, uh, the foundation for what we should expect all clinicians to do isn't it by trainees not demonstrating those competencies and um, which there are sort of trends and forces seeking to, um, to erode that, that sort of foundation. Um, I have some thoughts, but actually, if it's okay, I'll uh, turn it over to the panel to see whether or not you guys have any thoughts, too. I have an organizational experience that is related, I believe, and um, let me begin by saying, I mean, no offense to the institution that I'd like to name, because the people that work for it, I think, are great people on their own paths of learning. Um, and, and I'm talking about the Department of Corrections, which is an institution that Volunteers of America has a very formal relationship with. And I'm related to an experience we had where we work with, the, the relationship is basically a, a program where we provide rigorous clinical residential services to um, individuals who identify as men coming out of the correction system who for six months have an opportunity to get substance use disorder treatment prior to being reintegrated into the community. It's a wonderful program, particularly in the face of Kentucky soon reaching the maximum capacity of all of our penal institutions. It's really important that we have access to care for individuals who have been incarcerated for drug-related crimes. So in that program, we have had um, trans women who have been admitted into our program and one of the other, other structural and programmatic components that I'm so proud of that's very much part and parcel of how we do business is we approach all of our addiction recovery services from a very trauma-informed mm -hmm. perspective, getting to what I heard Dr. Hurley refer to earlier as you know, digging out some of the root causes and recognizing substance use has been a solution to a different problem. So we get to, to the extent possible with the individual working with to those root causes and so have a lot of trauma informed practices and groups and therapies um, to facilitate that. Well, in this particular case, um, Department of Corrections um, had actually through their practices exposed this individual to additional trauma while she was incarcerated. And um, so came to us with some additional wounds and through our practices and through our interaction with the staff that we must partner with through corrections, it was very apparent to us that we were in very different places along our learning paths and so had to behave as very assertive advocates on behalf of this um, woman who wished to be in a treatment environment free from abuse and distress, but unfortunately had experienced that. And, and we had to go through multiple rounds of discussion and, um, and, and debate even around how we wish to treat her and be very respectful and honoring her. Um, and and that, was, that was not an easy process. And so I do think that from an organizational perspective, we are proud to, at a macro level, engage in advocacy and practices to help move the needle. Um, and some of that just begins with some basic education and, and bringing awareness. And I think that's best facilitated through relationships. And so we leveraged our staff relationships to help connect with the staff at Corrections who were unfortunately, and I, don't, I, I, I strongly believe this was not intentional, but there was a lot of unintentional impact and consequences. And so we really leveraged our staff to provide education and outreach to Corrections staff. And I'll follow up even from a macro perspective, but micro perspective. If we see something that is that is not right, or we have a concern, advocating for our patients, advocating for proper treatment, proper care, um, and pushing that, kind of pushing it up the chain, uh, so to speak. If we see something, taking it to supervisors, taking it to leadership, taking it to the next level, uh, utilizing any resources or services that we can, making sure we're connected with community resources, um, and advocating as much as we can, and, and pushing and promoting that. At the uh, risk of being self-promoting, the AAMC has this implementation guide regarding competencies for uh, um, uh, medical practice with respect to LGBT um, gender nonconforming and people with differences of sex development. I, I do think that that um, document and the fact that it's coming from the AAMC, if I was a medical educator, 
creates an opportunity to inculcate those as these are the standards that we expect, these are competencies that we expect at our institution. And they're competencies at which you can hold people accountable. When I was a medical student, um, I was, uh, started medical school shortly after, and I went to medical school at the University of Southern California, which had instituted a professionalism course uh, shortly before I had started there. And uh, I was in a, a small multidisciplinary group with an individual who um, had all sorts of things that he wasn't willing to do because of his uh, religious affiliation. And actually, he ultimately did not, um, uh, did not pass the professionalism course because the instructors of that course said, you know, based on your performance and the way that you, the sort of statements that you made and what's clear from uh, your introduction to clinical medicine course, so what we've observed, um, it's not clear to me that you've met the minimum requirements. And so putting into place um, curricular structures that prevent advancement when people don't meet those thresholds is one tool you can use in order to, um, uh, and, and, and uh, this person, it wasn't that they were essentially kicked out of school, they were just invited to repeat the year, right? Um, with the idea of uh, you do first year again and you demonstrate that you can um, get these competencies the same way that if I, you know, if I'd failed neuroscience or if I'd failed, you know, anatomy, right, um, then I wouldn't have been able to pass through the first year, I would have had to repeat the year. So, so um, the, you create an institutional culture that values those competencies. I think that needs to start a governance, right? You start a governance, it then becomes part of your core values, that then gets expressed um, in how you, uh, you the sort of specific um, uh, uh, practice parameters and policies in the institution that then, at least in a medical school or a health professional school, becomes then part of the curriculum. And that's how that gets expressed. And when somebody, the same way that, you, you know, it wouldn't be tolerated for somebody to not do an obstetrics or gynecology rotation because of their feelings about women, right? That wouldn't be acceptable. It wouldn't be acceptable um, for somebody to practice without, you know, sort of being free of homophobia, transphobia, and, uh, and uh, heterosexism, um, and without sort of being reasonably familiar with the issues facing LGBT communities. I think that that, that would be the way that that would enact. And, and it's sort of easy for me to stand up here and say that. That's a tremendous amount of work, right? It's a tremendous amount of work to align governance with policies and procedures, with then core values, policy procedures, and actually sort of curricular tools. Um, but it's certainly worth work doing from my perspective. Yes. I'm going to bring up. Oh, we have a, we have a mic. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Just for you. Is it on? Oh, Lord. Okay. Um, I have a two part question. Um, so, we're all in nursing school. We're about to graduate. Uh, so, the first question is unfortunately, not everyone is as open to LGBT as all of us are. That's why we're here. And when we ask the question about, you know, what kind of pronoun would you like to use? What if you have backlash? Like, what if the person's like, what do you mean what kind of pronoun do I use? And they get angry at you because I've tried to implement that in my assessments when I've been going to my clinicals and stuff. And I've had some particularly elderly who are like, why are you asking me that question? What do you mean? I'm a woman. Why I'm a man? Like, how do you address that? And then the second is, um, I also work EMS, and a lot of times we don't have time to sit down and have a full conversation with our patients. Um, and I don't want them to feel that I'm not compassionate to their situation. And sometimes we can't say, you know, what do you like to be called or how can I address you? And so you address them by how they look. How would you address it in that situation? I, I can tell you what I do clinically, which is when I ask people about, um, uh, the, the terms that, the, in, in, uh, to which they want to be referred, I start with myself. I say, I'm Brian, um, I identify as a he, him, and his, um, and I wonder what pronouns would you like me to address you in? And if somebody gets upset, what, what do you mean? I'm, you know, I'm, why, why would you ask me that? I would say, oh, it, um, I, I would just do a reflection. Okay, it sounds like you want me to address you as she, her, and hers, got it. You know, like, and, 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 and sort of like, um, and, and sort of like leave it there. Like I wouldn't do that. Well, I need to ask you this because it's like I wouldn't defend it. I would just sort of roll with it, right? I would use a reflection and say, okay, that sounds like where you're at. Moving on. Um, and that oftentimes, and uh, whenever, just as a general sort of like clinical approach, whenever anybody has come to me sort of like uh, um, in a attacking or challengeful way. So I'm a psychiatrist. And I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a hospital room because I'm doing a psychiatric consult and someone's like, I don't need to talk to a psychiatrist. Rah! Um, 
than, than just using reflections, right? Like, you, like you, do, you know, you're angry with me. You don't, you know, you don't want to talk to a psychiatrist. Like, it, just sort of reflecting what somebody says can be very disarming because you're acknowledging what they're saying. Um, so I would use a reflection in that instance. Okay, she, her, hers, got it. You know, and then, and then I would probably pivot to the next question, and then that helps diffuse it a bit. Um, you asked the second question of what if you're in a clinical situation, which is pretty, um, you know, an, an acute situation where you don't do a full psychosocial history on somebody, like it's so in an emergency situation. Oftentimes in, a, in emergency situations, you're focused on whatever you need to know right then. So if you have the chance to talk to somebody, um, you know, it might be worth asking, okay, you know, how would you like me to refer to you? Um, can be a quick sort of a quick question in order to be able to get information. Um, but I, I don't know that I would necessarily explore the more comprehensive psychosocial history unless it's relevant to whatever's being asked. Um, but how do you want me to refer to you? Is a relative, it's a relatively quick question to ask. Somebody will give you an answer. It might be a name, it might be you know something else, and then, then I would just use whatever they said and move on. Um, because again, in an emergency situation, you need to be sort of focused on what. Uh, does that answer your questions? I don't know if anybody else on the panel has any other thoughts. Uh -huh. Yes, My, uh, we got a mic for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, one simple way to perhaps address that would be on your intake form, which people fill out uh, pre preliminarily to meeting with somebody, along with other questions, just say, what's your preferred pronoun? And then, then it's sort of, then you have that information when you meet with them. Well said. Uh, we'll go over he here and then over there. Give me a minute. <laughs> but my question is basically, it sounds like when you went into uh, the place to the institution, they treated you with respect and fairly where you felt safe. Well, my question is, where was your treatment tailored towards the issues that brought you there? in the first place, and if not, what can they do to improve it, or what would you like to see to have better helped you get uh, the results that you needed quicker? Um, yes, um, the treatment was towards what I was brought in for. It, um, I remember the first treatment was for basically just physical abuse, mental abuse. I was treated for that. I was placed in the right place for it, as you would say. I was um, the approach to it was I'm going to say it wasn't as good as she should have been, mm. because I did have to continue treatment outside of it. You got to understand, a lot of these mental health facilities can't treat for everything while you're in. Um, as far as depression, anxiety. It's just, it, it's just a building block to start you with. You have to continue outside of the source when you're outside of the hospital. Um, counseling is the main part of it. But the best part about it was when I was put in, I was, I was made welcome mm -hmm. um, and got me started to where I could continue to be on that side. Is there anything that, um, uh, where you sought your mental health care, is there anything that could have been uh, on the inpatient side that you feel like would have helped? Or anything additional that you didn't see but you think would be helpful? Mm. There's a lot of things they could have done, mm. but they, their self, they didn't have the resources to do it. Um, um, as far as protecting you and keeping you alive while you're in, you're good, but it's 
totally up to you when you get out, mm -hmm. what you're going to do with your life. And I chose to go to South Counseling mm -hmm. outside of that. I am currently in IOP. So it's made a big difference in my life. Mm -hmm. I used to just be put in a mental hospital, let out in seven days. And, and that was that? Uh, yes, yeah. that was it. In a couple of weeks, I would end back, back up in the mental hospital again, house for seven days, let out. And I guess under the 202A law, that they seen that I wouldn't get no better. So that like, last time I was at the mental hospital, I had to sign an agreed order to go to IOP on the outside mm -hmm. in order to stay out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that. It's been really good on my point. I thank God I've been out for a year now. And um, I don't have any plans in going back. <laughs> but again, it it's just a the mental hospital is a place to keep you alive while you're in. They're just they don't have everything that you would need for every person out there. Thank you very much. I think there was a question over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Cindy Mayarella, and I am the supervisor of the specialty clinic, and we're an STD clinic. Um, and I so appreciate seeing so many familiar faces here, and I'm grateful to be here. And thank you, uh, Mandy, for, for sharing part of your story with us. And I have um, two questions. Um, one of the things that besides seeing a rise in STDs and drug addiction in Louisville, Kentucky, um, some of the roadblocks we have are religious and political. And um, so I had an awesome opportunity to talk to uh, one of the women from the school district. And so two, two of my questions are, and Mandy, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable whatsoever, but I'm curious to know um, at what age you felt that you could have used the help with your um, uh, your uh, gender identity and um, also for Dr. Hurley, um, what information, if you have, could you share with me on how to break through some of those barriers? Uh, as a nurse for 22 years, uh, I love prevention. I hate to see people um, after they have, you know, acquired an STD or HIV. And um, boy, I tell you, I, if there's nothing I'm more passionate about is prevention and you know that age we need to target and how to make change here in our city. I was about the age of seven years old when I first realized that I wasn't who I was supposed to have been. Um, I struggled when I was, um, I struggled all through in high school. I struggled after high school. We didn't have, back in the 70s and the 80s, we didn't have anything. We didn't know what gender transition was. And I, it's only a couple of years ago, it was like, I was on a computer and it's like, I was reading up on transgender. And it came to my conclusion, okay, I am transgender. I know I went to seeking counseling. I went to seeking doctors. Um, I didn't really have a doctor in Louisville. That's why I said before I had to buy my HR from another country. And after finding out how dangerous that was. I didn't know my medication levels. I didn't know nothing about it. I was just doing it. I finally had to seek out a counselor, seek out an ethnologist, and I started transitioning two years ago. But I've all, during my whole life, I wore female clothes. I was Um, 
by some, I would like, they would probably say I was cross-dressing because no, I wasn't cross-dressing. I know what I am. Um, but that's when I actually started to realize that I was transgender. So I went to live in life as a woman. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you asked about uh, sort of resources to to move forward, um, and I just want to sort of clarify the question: Are you talking about STD prevention in general, or are you talking about because um, uh, uh, there's so many resources in so many areas? I'm wondering if I, I could sort of click down a little further on that. Um, STDs and sex education. So. Relationship education. Sure. Um, so, you know, SCDs uh, and relationship education. I think um, I would like to see um, more sort of STD prevention services like all over the place. So schools, um, institutions where sort of the, the public, I mean, I think, you know, uh, for at-risk populations, uh, things like pre-exposure pro, um, prophylaxis would be like a huge game changer around HIV because we have the tools to eliminate the spread of HIV now. It's just a matter of actually getting those tools implemented. Um, and those tools should be implemented sort of everywhere people are. So I'd like to see sort of uh, prevention and counseling services or prevention and early intervention services um, in, I, I would think for youth populations and schools or uh, community groups uh, uh, makes sense. Um, for uh, uh, colleges and universities, um, and then for any place that people get health services. So there is a historically, because of funding differences, carve outs between where uh, addiction services are offered, mental health services are offered, and physical health services that are offered. And I understand the rationale between wanting to dedicate funding streams, but I do think that there's an important to integrate primary care into mental health and addiction, to integrate STD prevention and early intervention services. Um, and that might mean uh, mingling funding streams in ways that sort of don't don't currently happen right now. Um, I think around sort of education in general um, and, and sex education uh, is a, in my mind, a sort of a core component of health. Um, and there are, you know, I, I have uh, colleagues in Los Angeles that work for the Department of Health, but that's their whole job, right, is to uh, integrate sex education and um, sexual health information um, throughout the treatment infrastructure. Uh, I, I um, cannot honestly sit here and say the LA County Public Health System has necessarily achieved a great amount of success. Um, uh, and I don't have like off the top of my head like the guidebook or the resource to give to you right now, but it's something I'd be happy to get back to you and sort of talk to my colleagues and get back to you on um, because I do think it's really critically important. Sexual, our sexual health is a core component of our overall health and um, I, I think this entire process of sort of segregating treatment into silos um, is one of the things that's a big threat to that. So I wish I had like the perfect resource to throw up on a slide here and I don't, but I'm happy to get back to you with, with what I'm able to find. One quick point I wanted to mention, oh, yes. speaking of PrEP, Please. Volunteers of America, and I see some of my colleagues here representing our HIV Services Department, we have been in a conversation with House of Ruth, and recently I have even talked to Dr. Dunn about this, regarding the importance of getting primary care physicians to offer an HIV test and to talk about PrEP. There are so many, and even our largest healthcare system in town, where we have some great experts around infectious disease prevention, and then another part of that same organization that doesn't know what PrEP is. Mm -hmm. So we're interested as an organization in trying to have a community-wide conversation around this to implement a strategy to bring that education and awareness into doctor's offices and into those large healthcare systems um, so that they know what PrEP is, they're prepared to offer it, and they offer as just a standard practice an HIV test. Do you have anything you want to offer? Um, other than, I mean, in addition to PrEP, like uh, vaccinations for hepatitis A and B, uh, looking at that, making Completely. that aware, and bringing that, because we are seeing such an explosion in that um, issue in Louisville specifically. For hepatitis C, um, I know that there are uh, some newer but very expensive treatments available that um, are much better tolerated than interferon and ribavirin. So, um, and I'm not here on behalf of any drug company, I promise you. But like Har Harvoni, for example, um, uh, I do know that I, there are investigators in Los Angeles that are intensely interested around linking people to HIV and hepatitis C treatment services, um, particularly among, um, yeah, the county operates a whole number of services 
around people who are homeless and potentially injection drug users that have high rates of HIV and hepatitis C. I wonder, is there anything here in Louisville um, uh, that utilizes any of those treatments? Volunteers of America, we provide, and our partners at the Louisville Department of Public Health and Wellness provide HIV um, testing and outreach to those groups deemed highest risk by the CDC. So that includes people who inject drugs, men yeah. who have sex with men, high-risk heterosexuals, typically women of color, and recognizing that HIV, hepatitis C, and syphilis and other STIs often travel together. So we're providing the testing and linking people into care if they're positive. We have a partnership with the University of Louisville 550 Clinic. Um, so we're doing that not only within our own organization, providing those tests and education, safer sex supplies, because we provide homeless services, we provide addiction recovery services, but also outreaching to other institutions in the community to provide those services too. Cool. And also the, the needle exchange program that facilitates that in uh, harm reduction um, policies with that. And then I can't resist asking, but um, does your needle exchange program distribute naloxone at all? Yes, we do. Awesome. Uh, yes, over there. Oh, the mic is coming. I promise. <laughs> where, where are we? I'll come back. Right down here. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Down here. Sorry. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Hi, I've been a nurse for 21 years as well, and um, I currently work in pediatric endocrinology, and so we do a lot of. Um, things with the trans uh, community and the LGBT. So I thank you for your testimony for coming today. But one of the things that um, I constantly ask um, because of the background that I was raised in is about the pronouns. And I know that that's a big deal and that um, a lot of people really want to emphasize the pronouns. However, I feel that the pronouns are getting in the way of uh, um, bridging that gap between um, people that are not as accepting of the community and the people that are in the community. So where you have employers and you have staff that are not ha as accepting and you start putting these pronouns, which by the way, feel like third person and mm -hmm. not very personable and you haven't made that person, you've kind of taken the person um, the humanization out of it to me and that's my perspective and um, you know I want to know hi my name is Leslie how it's nice to meet you today mm -hmm. uh, you know I'm glad to meet you Mandy you know or um, what is your name mm -hmm. you know you can put what you identify as on a form um, and I can document all day about what your pronoun is and and how you identify and and all of that information but I'm not going to call you he she, there, or that, that is third person and that's how you talk about someone, that's not how you talk to someone. So to me, um, I think it's dehumanizing to use pronouns uh, when you're trying to be very, you know, personal with someone and gain trust as a healthcare provider. Um, to a community and make sure that you're giving them the dignity and respect that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And as far as a, as a nurse, I don't really care what you identify as or what your orientation is or what your gender is. My goal and my uh, whole thing is to take care of you because you're my patient. And I'm going to love you and serve you no matter who you are, what you identify with, or what your orientation is. Mm -hmm. And that's just the bottom line. And I think that all of our healthcare providers um, basically feel that way, but when you start putting things in their way, then you start putting their personal feelings into it, and you started taking their oath out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's just, um, that's just kind of my um, opinion, mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, you could start um, thinking of, of that from the other side, because like I said, I was raised in a very strict uh, you know, Christian conservative home. I still love and still take care of people, and I and I work in a, in a community that is very accepting mm -hmm. and help do hormonal. You know, we do HR uh, in a pediatric level. So um, I think that's what gets in the way is you're taking the humanization out of it, the personalization out of it. You know, um, I don't want to be identified as a she. I want to be identified as Leslie because that's my name, you know, so 
maybe that's something that would help bridge that gap. I uh, appreciate your comment. Any reactions from the panel? I mean, I, I understand that as well. But I'm, you know, if somebody, just the example you used earlier, like, hi, my name is Michael. Hello, John. Uh, my name is Michael. And it kind of, I don't know if it irritates me when somebody says, I uh, say, hi, my name is Michael. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, that bothers me because I'm like, good intentions, trying to, you know, uh, connect with me, uh, have some, you know, kind of bring a relationship maybe together, but my name is Michael and I prefer that. So just asking me, that's, I think that's the main message I have is what is your preference? What, how would you like me to address you? Uh, how would you like our interaction to go? What do you want to know about? What do you want me to know about you? Uh, that's the, the number one thing for me. Like what is important uh, for me to know so I can better work with you? Are there anything that's going to strengthen our bond or that I need to be aware of so I'm more uh, connected with you as we're working together? Whatever that is. I mean, we could probably debate lots of different things. Uh, and I'm not, I, I, don't, I hadn't thought about the pronoun issue, really, just to be honest. But I do know if you're telling me your name, I want to be called by that. And what are things that are important to you so I know that we can connect on those issues? That's, that's the main thing for me is just letting me know you. Two comments. One is that I think your point, I hear you, and uh, it seems to confound the point around pronouns. It's not a way that I would address Michael directly, only if it's appropriate to use a pronoun and refer to him in third person. It wouldn't be a substitute for me relating to him by his first name. And, and then I, I guess I, I hope we can all aspire to be abundantly humble and deferential to the community. And so I just would ask us to consider if we are not a part of the community, is it okay then to be humble and deferential to how the community um, and that individual in the community wishes to be related to? Um, and I think that is actually, I feel as a, I'm, I'm also a licensed clinical social worker from a direct clinical perspective as a provider, I want to err on the side of an abundance of deference to the individual I'm talking to instead of having these boundaries around what I prefer and what I think is the right way. And I appreciate so much too your recognition of the role that upbringing and family of origin and a religious perspective, has, and how, how influential that is for all of us. And maybe keeping that at the forefront and suspending our personal judgments around what, we, what I personally think about pronouns, pronoun use is really irrelevant to my role as a clinician and deferring to how the individual I'm working with wishes to be related to, if that makes sense. Um, my, uh, my own response is I actually don't disagree with anything that you said. I think that when I'm working with somebody, I refer to them by their name. I think it, that makes sense. Um, I do know that I ran into trouble with this, and I'll just sort of sort of out myself in an, in an embarrassing way. I was a medical student working at an LGBT clinic in Washington, DC. And um, I had interviewed a patient and um, I, I used his name when I was in, that room, in the room with him. But medical students have to present cases to your attending, you know. And so I walked to the attending's office and when you present, you know, this is a 32 year old, you know, and, and I have to use a, a, a gender term. 
and, um, and I misgendered the patient. And the patient heard, because they were right next door. And um, that was an instance where I didn't collect the pronoun information that, that, I, that honestly I needed to use in order to do an effective presentation that ultimately did affect patient care. I do think the patient was actually very upset to be going to an LGBT health center and to be misgendered by a clinician. At, at this point, it was a medical student, but by a clinician working in that center. So I am fully on board with collecting information at the time and place where it's appropriate. And it would have been really appropriate for me to have collected that information before I went to go do the presentation. Do you know what I'm saying? Not necessarily for what I was going to say to say to that patient in the room, but like for you know how I was going to go uh, present the patient. And the last thing I mention is um, you know I have a psychiatric private practice where uh, you know. I'm, I'm the everything. I do my own scheduling. I, you know, patients come in, they, they meet me. I don't, um, there's a front desk person for the office suite, but they don't, they don't greet people. I, I come out and greet people directly. Um, I don't even get to pronouns until probably like 45 minutes into the evaluation, right? After I've gotten a sense of, you know, who they are, how, how, how they identify themselves by their name, not necessarily by their pronouns. Um, and it isn't really until I get to like the social history section when I'm asking somebody about their experience in their lives, um, when I, you know, I do the sort of thing of like, so, you know, I mentioned I'm uh, Dr. Hurley, I identify as a ham, and I wonder if there's pronouns that you, you, you know, that you feel comfortable with or that you use. And by that point, um, you know, I treat all kinds of people. I treat straight people too. Um, straight, <laughs> straight, straight cisgender people need care as well. And, uh, <laughs> And, um, and I have yet to have anybody like react, right? But that's because we're 45 minutes into it and, and they already have a sense of who I am and who they are and I'm also a psychiatrist so these very long evaluations and you know, um, and that fits for my practice. It would be different if I was a family doc and I had you know, 15 minutes for, you know, for meeting somebody and sort of figuring it out. Um, so there's lots of ways of doing it and, uh, and I think to your point, um, you know, if you start with pronouns every single time in every single situation, that won't work. I agree with you. It won't. You need, you know, you need to collect that that information at the point where it's appropriate. And there are instances where you need to know that sooner, and there's instances where you don't need to know it as as, as quickly. But the point is, is um, I, I, I uh, really like the phrase abundance of deference. That you want to have an abundance of deference in whatever situation you're doing um, to make sure you're headed in the right direction. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Yes, over here. Hey, greetings. <clears throat> uh, I'm Kawan Owens, licensed clinical social worker, uh, middle school counselor. Um, I have like two questions and two comments, but I'm just going to go with one for respect of everybody's time. Um, so I currently am a middle school counselor, as I uh, mentioned, at an all-male school, uh, and we also have a boarding component. Like historically, we've been a boarding school. Um, so I guess my question for anybody who wants to answer, but I'm particularly curious to hear Mandy's perspective. Um, for kids who are entering our school, let's say the sixth grade around age 11, 12, um, we haven't had this issue yet in our 13 years of existence, but if one were to identify themselves as trans at that age, would, I guess, what's the thought process as far as admissions goes? I mean, we're a private school, so I mean, technically we can re re um, reserve the right to defer anybody, but I don't think that we'd like to, like especially myself being an LCSW um, and social worker, but what's the thought process with having, um, let's say a young man who might identify themselves as a woman or a young woman at birth who might identify themselves as a man in an all boys school? Like, do you think that that might be something that as far as being like trauma informed care that we should be hesitant of, or is that something that we should be like really I guess have a lot of deference and uh, acceptance. I don't know. I like just just wanted to pick somebody's brain who might have a little bit more experience in that thought process. Do you feel comfortable uh, addressing that? What you're asking is they all identified as an all male an all male school. Mm -hmm. I really don't know how to answer that one. Could 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 I take a crack at it if that's okay? Would that be all right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. 
Um, so I imagine that um, if there was a transgender student who identified as male, right, that, that was their, their, their gender identity, I imagine that going to an all-male all school, which comports with that internal sense of gender, um, could make a lot of sense and really actually support that person's sort of development and evolution as a man, which is how they, you know, how, how they identify. Um, I could also imagine a situation where um, somebody uh, may enroll in the school initially, um, being male identified as birth, and then over the course of their adolescence, come to identify middle school experience, I should say, um, uh, uh, come to recognize that their gender identity doesn't, is, is not male and is actually female. And I imagine, I could imagine that being in an all male school might be discordant with, with that internal experience. So um, kind of going back to, to an abundance of deference, I would in some ways want to defer to the student around what do the, what's their internal experience and um, to what extent is your school set up to support that, um, recognizing that people might have a variety of responses and reactions. And I would think that your school would want to be in a position of, within the boundaries of your resources, being able to support somebody in whatever direction that they wanted to go. With, with that, I'll sort of want, want to turn it over to see if others on the panel have any other thoughts. Oh, other piece? Yeah. yeah. So the other thing is that it's a boarding school, which means that they would be sleeping amongst each other and also, in theory, showering amongst each other and changing locker rooms amongst each other. So just putting that caveat in mm -hmm. it just to make things more sticky. Mm -hmm. I want to say that's above my pay grade to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, I think you're right. There's a lot of different factors, the individual, their family, the culture of the school and the, the, the support they would have and looking at those, how do you deal with those other issues that come along? Uh, that's a really complicated question, in my opinion, uh, and it would, I think, depend on a number of factors. You know, the, 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 the amount of support the student has themselves, uh, kind of how where they are in their journey um, for their self-identity, uh, and again, for sure, the culture of the environment and looking at those things that have to be considered, uh, whether it's sleeping arrangements, bathroom arrangements, other uh, issues. Uh, so that's a very complicated but great question to ask. You, um, I, I would just say you had mentioned um, uh, rooming, showers, and lockers. I think that um, there's been a, a, where people get to pee has become a political issue, right? <laughs> and um, in a way that, that isn't particularly logical. I think that um, uh, supporting people choosing a bathroom that fits kind of how they carry themselves is logical. It sort of makes sense. Um, and the idea that we would sort of create policing around that is... Uh, well, is political um, and, and not necessarily based in, in anything practical from my vantage point. I would say, um, and this is true for addiction treatment facilities where people are living on site, you do want to create privacy for, for the people that you're supporting. And so um, one of the questions I might ask a prospective student or even a current student who might be considering transition is what, what, are the, what privacy needs do, do they think that they have and then what extent can your school um, uh, accommodate? Um, and it, I don't mean in like an uh, educational accommodation. I just mean like sort of respect those uh, uh, reasonable privacy concerns. Um, I do think that at most addiction treatment facilities, the idea that you can sort of shower in private and change in private is a reasonable expectation. Um, and I don't know how your boarding school is set up and how the facilities are set up, but I think that that might be a reasonable request from uh, from a, a student that was attending there, particularly if they're um, if they were considering transition and had some self consciousness around uh, around their bodies. But that that would be kind of um, I, I include that only as an area of questioning and inquiry rather than as a firm you know rule. Um, but that, that's how I would probably approach it. Oh, back there, sorry. <laughs> My eye level is here, <laughs> so I uh, appreciate your waving. Hi, my name is Patty. I'm uh, a clinical psychologist at the VA here in Louisville, and we have several clinicians from the VA and our LGBT veteran care coordinators down front. So I wanted to promote, um, for one thing, that um, if there are individuals in the community who are veterans and are not receiving uh, 
care at the VA, they may be eligible and, and you know, getting in contact with us to find out if they're eligible for care could be a big part of um, treatment. We do provide uh, PrEP, we do provide um, gender confirming hormone therapy. Um, we have a, a ton of services for homeless veterans, mental health services, all, all kinds of things. So that being, you know, one piece, send us veterans. Um, and we want to reach out and connect with those veterans. Um, one thing I wanted to, to touch on was the piece about identity. And if we are caring for someone, what do we need to know about their identity and why? And I think there's a really great video out there called To Treat Me, You Have to Know Who I Am. Mm. And I think watching that was very helpful for me as a cisgendered heterosexual woman to see how difficult it might be for someone who has an identity that is not the majority coming into a situation and not knowing what's okay and safe to share. So being able to be proactive about creating a safe environment and be proactive about letting people know that I want to know who they are and how that will impact the care I provide. Um, I think is vital. Um, at the VA, I think we run into something being in a bureaucracy and a huge system that you talked about support for someone who's going through recovery and having an LGBT community can be a part of that if part of their identity need, you know, they need support with that. We've tried several times to create like community support groups within the VA for LGBT veterans and sometimes attendance is not very high. So if any of you all on the panel um, or anyone in here has any input for how to create that safe environment within a community where they may have had a history of being discriminated while they were in the military with Don't Ask, Don't Tell or in the community or wherever, we want to create that environment and it's probably kind of tough. We don't want to like target people and yet we want to create this inclusive community and spaces where they can get support from other people who have a, an identity that they may be kind of working through. Just to repeat it, you had said the video that was a game changer for you was to treat me, you have to know me. All right, so to treat me, you have to know who I am. Um, so if anyone wants to write that down, that sounds like an important tip. Um, so uh, you mentioned the VA. I can just speak to my experience. I was a fellow there for a year um, and it worked there uh, a couple years before. Um, and. I've seen at, at least the Greater Los Angeles VA and at the Manhattan VA in New York City, um, they did run LGBT um, kind of affinity groups for patients um, in specific treatment programs, typically people in behavioral health treatments. Um, I think uh, at least in those institutions, there was a critical mass of, uh, of veterans there that sort of served as an important nucleus. Um, my general advice might be to ask those veterans, um, to ask prospective veterans, uh, what would a group, what would a group look like at the VA that they would like to see? When would it be scheduled? Where would it be? You know, um, so that you can sort of shape it according to the uh, needs, desires, and preferences of the people that, that you're hoping to include. Um, I would have sort of like two questions uh, for those folks. One is, um, would a uh, LGBT group supporting veterans should it be at the VA? Or should it be somewhere else? I would, you know, because it might it might not be that your um, population of interest is necessarily interested in receiving services there. It might be that they're interested in receiving, you know, support out in the community, which would sort of change the strategy. Um, and then the other sort of question I would ask is, what are the um, external to the VA community resources that people could take advantage of? Because if you're not able to get a critical mass in order to get a group going, uh, it would then be important to, to leverage your partners to make sure that people have the support that they need uh, to support their recovery. I don't know if anybody has any. Well, in addition to that, and I don't know if signs aren't like this, the fix for everything, but I always had like in my offices signs that just it, it indicated inclusion, indicated this was a safe space. This one just says safe zone, uh, sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity. Uh, this one's safe zone, I'm an ally. So there's other resources that you can put up, and I just had them at kind of inconspicuous places in my uh, therapy room or where I did assessments. Uh, not a, I didn't have a big rainbow flag on the wall necessarily, <laughs> but just to indicate this is a safe space, kind of like, you know, um, YMCA safe place signs, but also having these posted in conspicuous places that weren't overwhelming uh, and just making that clear kind of upfront to 
talking about uh, the environment we're in, uh, confidentiality again, but just uh, in, encouraging that this, this is a safe space that you can talk about what you need to talk about. I think there was a question or comment right here. Actually, there's two. So we'll go with uh, the woman in the gray and then the woman in the black. Um, I just want to stress like the importance of just the general public of being aware of all of this and having really good understanding for this because it's just so important for me to feel like anybody can come and talk to me about anything. I'm super open. Like, you know, I, I want to help you as much as I can. And a lot of people don't have the money, the access, the resources to get help, even professional help. And so it's important for us to be their support system, even if we don't really know them. It's it's important for them. It makes them feel good. Like, I want to be that person for you. Um, and kind of when you were telling us about the story when you were buying flowers for your husband, like, even just little tiny things like that 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 woman just assumed, mm -hmm. little things like that over time really get to people. And it might just be that one small little instance, but those small little instances are super, super important to be aware of and conscious of. And yeah, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the comment. There's actually some literature on this looking at what are the factors, um, and I, this is from the medical literature, but what are the factors associated with um, LGBT affirming attitudes? And what they did, um, or this was a medical school in Oregon, um, uh, uh, took surveys of students who went through an LGBT curriculum and surveys of students who didn't and said, what are your knowledge, skills, and attitudes with respect to LGBT health? And at least on the attitudinal domain, um, going through an LGBT health curriculum or, you know, uh, maybe case in point here, a certificate program um, made no difference in LGBT attitudes. But what seemed to make a difference for LGBT attitudes was peace, people's personal experiences with LGBT people. So in my view, the most effective intervention that you can do to shape somebody's attitude is to actually connect them to people who identify as LGB or T, because that shapes attitudes more than statistics, numbers, graphs, or any sort of didactic information. Um, and as a result, I have always felt that it's important for any LGBT programming that I do, one, is to be out, and two, to include other people that are out to generate those personal experiences, because that's what's been shown to, to shape attitudes. And that's why being out has a really important cultural influence, is because it ultimately then broadens um, our sociocultural norms around sex, gender, and roles and identities um, to expand to include, you know, a whole uh, the the very broad diversity present in the human experience. Um, and in some ways, it, there's a tension between you need to respect when people are ready to be out and 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 out in which situations and when, um, while also acknowledging that the act of being out has a very important cultural effect, um, not necessarily in that moment, but in some with all of the other moments in which people are being out in their communities. So I, I think you make a great point that touches on those two things, which is personal experience with LGBT people can be very transforming to people's attitudes. And that's why being out is actually such a vitally important um, step to take. Um, again, when somebody's ready, it's not up to somebody to sort of change the world on their own, but when somebody's ready to be out, it can have a huge impact. So thank you for your comments. And just one other small thing, like we live in Kentucky, so not far out of Louisville, people are still really discriminated. And so it's important that we are, we advocate and we represent all of Kentucky, not just Louisville, because we're super blessed to live here. Um, but there's such a huge part of our population that is underrepresented. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a nurse, and I just wanted to comment on some By stuff the way, that has come up. I just have up. to say, nurses have yeah. represented here. Yeah. Right? So thank, thank you so much for all the nurses that are in attendance. I, I apologize uh, for interrupting. Please. And I work with nursing students um, as as one of my jobs, but I wanted to um, just uh, kind of um, encourage you to recognize that you know when you assess. You, it requires interpretation skills, um, and it requires us to look at nuances, and everything's not one way or the other, black or white. And so when you do get that patient that is pushing back, you can really quickly adjust 
and go with them because um, I think it's really clear to be aware of, of your role as a nurse. So it's not to educate on a particular issue, but it is to make them feel welcome. And that includes you know, racist, sexist people too. Yeah. Um, and so we can make them feel welcome and make that quick adjustment. And it might not, not even, and I'm picking on you because I think you're strong enough, but it might not even be to say, okay, I get it. He, she, or right. she, her, right. you know, it would be to maybe do that silently, but to make that quick adjustment because you have those interpretive skills. I also want to put a plug in for, we need to continue to learn those skills or not. Um, <laughs> We're not, we don't have those because we're female or we're nurses. It's a, it's a um, uh, really, um, what am I trying to say? It's a skill that you need to learn over time um, and that you can continue to add to in your arsenal. Um, but going back to the panel, I wanted to ask you guys um, that, oh, one more thing too. And, and these terms that come about, are often from the population themselves. It's not a hetero woman deciding, this is a good term to call these people. We have those terms too, but they don't like them, right? Um, <laughs> or we don't like them. So there's a reason why those terms are out there. When, when we're saying that some people don't like those terms, there's a reason those terms are out there. That population has asked, you know, if you respect me, this is the term that you're gonna use. So it's, it's I think that's important to um, recognize when the term, who. Who, where did that term come from? Who asked for that term? Um, and that's a, one, a good way to gauge how respectful that term is. Um, so it's using, it's having all those in your arsenal and, and knowing when to pull them out and recognizing there's nuances and um, it's not gonna always be the same way for everybody. But, um, so you guys, I actually have a question. <laughs> um, I'm interested in, from an organizational perspective, um, and you can share from your organization and then other things you've seen, how, how um, common is it to see these healthcare organizations reflecting this diversity in their um, intake paperwork? Like, are you seeing that in their, in your, is it in your paperwork? You know, how do you identify? Are you doing it kind of on a personal level, asking those questions, or are you seeing it kind of um, okayed by your institutions? So how do you identify um, that, those kinds of questions? I think we have a lot of work to do in this area to make this a uniform standard of practice. And I'll, I'll speak for Volunteers of America and say in certain segments of our organization, we excel and in other parts, I'm not proud of where we're at today. Um, I invited intentionally a member of our HR team, Pamela Williams, who's here today because I wanted her to, to hear this and experience this. Um, and I have other colleagues here too. And, um, one of the things that I hope we gain today is some newfound inspiration to keep pushing forward. Um, and that's just being as transparent and honest as I can be. And that's a, for an organization that is 122 years old, mm -hmm. that um, has a, a strong faith-based tradition, and who and which wants to be contemporary and responsive to um, people we're serving and we still are on our path. So um, we're, we're, we haven't arrived yet, but we are very much, I think as an organization, self-aware and willing to keep pushing those boundaries forward. And I concur. Uh, we are not where we need to be on those things, but moving forward, uh, pushing that every time we identify something or there's a new issue that comes up, things we had I hadn't thought about before because I, I can't think about everything. So looking at where, where we can, you know, make that change, where we can look at that, uh, and just I think because each individual is unique and they have they're the expert on their own, you know, situation, their own life. Uh, so taking that into consideration, it's hard necessarily to put on a form sometimes, but as a social worker and as you know, a therapist and somebody in this community that's compassionate, looking at where we can impact that change the most uh, and what, what we can do uh, to really get somebody involved and connected and feeling safe, uh, like this is a place they can trust. Um, so that's, that's the best I can answer that right now, but constantly looking at that and saying, are we doing what we need to do? Right. 
and it's not always in the forms because first we have to identify that it's not there and that's that's a lot of times from a personal perspective then we can kind of take that up and say this is an issue that we we're not ident we're not resolving we're not addressing sufficiently uh, so there's something we need to, to do differently about this uh, and you have to you know kind of be aware of that first before you can recognize what we're not doing right and then you can take action to change that so it's a constant change process the more we learn this is not something that the comments from today are going to oh we just do this and we're done forever uh, it's going to be a constantly evolving thing where we continue to learn but that's kind of how it happens in, in an organization where an individual will identify something and then we will say oh we need to do, need to do something about this and then we can uh, affect that change up, up the chain there are for what it's worth there are um, a set of forms that fenway health in boston massachusetts has and it's i think it's called the national center for lgbt health education or national center for lgbt health um, that can serve as like a template the, every form needs to be specific to the institution that you know you're collecting information for a purpose and that purpose can sometimes change but that is uh one one resource there's a comment back there and then we'll go up here Um, so I think this conversation has been really um, informative and very helpful, um, but I still feel like it's very binary. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering um, about how health healthcare organizations can um, fit the spectrum, you know, especially when it comes to housing or, you know, with, with intersex, um, what does that look like in a practical way? Mm -hmm. So, um, how, do I, how do I put this? Uh, the treatment systems that I know in healthcare are built around a, a binary. Um, people are housed in binary, they're labeled in binary ways, they're housed in binary ways. And so, given that that's the infrastructure, if I was running a treatment program, and I had an individual um, who uh, uh, said, I don't identify along the binary in whatever dimension, right? I don't identify as having binary sex development. I don't identify as having binary identity. I don't identify with a binary expression. Um, then I would ask, uh, I would sort of defer in some ways to that person and, and, and say, um, I will help navigate. This is, this is the milieu. This is the tools. This is what I have. Um, given your identity and your experience, um, uh, maybe we can come up with a plan together to um, make sure that your treatment goes the way that it needs to go. Um, so if it's for substance use disorder treatment and I'm thinking about housing them on a residential unit, it's, uh, these are the units available. This is what I see as the sort of advantages and disadvantages depending on, on where you're housed. Um, uh, where would you like to be housed? Um, I would, if I was running a treatment program, want to respect, again, somebody's privacy, right? Particularly if um, they were disinterested in sort of showering or changing in, in, in a group environment. And um, the last thing that I'd say is, uh, I have sometimes talked to treatment programs and say, well, you know, we can't accept a non-binary non patient because of the way the other patients are gonna react, right? And I would say, the problem in that case is not with the non-binary patient. The problem was with those other patients. So if somebody react, reacts poorly, that patient is the problem. You know, that, that person, that client, that individual that's reacting and not accepting to somebody's, um, you know, internal sense of self or external sort of gender expression, that is the problem. It's not the person with a non-binary non, uh, non identity. Um, uh, I wish that I would be able to create uh, an infrastructure in you that wasn't built around a binary. And, and at, at least at this point in sort of like my own personal development and in the sort of development of the treatment in, uh, industry and infrastructure, I don't have that, right? I don't have a non-binary world. But I, I, what I can do is partner with people in navigating that in a way that's gonna best fit given, given what we have available. So that would be kind of what I would offer. But you, you are right. There, um, uh, um, potentially in my defense, one of the reasons that I put reasonably is because we are encumbered by the sort of cultural expectations and norms that shape this sort of present moment in history. And I think what you're speaking to is there being a lot of work ahead in terms of um, embracing the full spectrum of sexual and gender diversity. And I, I um, you know, this is stuff that I, I feel like I understand reasonably well, and I'm still very much encumbered 
by my own binary thinking and by um, you know my own cisnormativity and by my you know and, and by my own baggage that sort of comes to me as a as somebody who's grown up in a culture. Um, so I want to acknowledge both that the, the, that you're right. There's a long long way to go, and that there is still a lot of binary thinking that's sort of implied, um, and that uh, the best thing that I can support an individual is just navigating that and the realities of, I think, it being difficult to be a non-binary non person in a world that has a bi very binary approach to it. I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of my best response. Anybody have any other thoughts? And then uh, comment up here. Oh, oh, I, oh sorry. Um, I just wanted to make uh try to make a quick comment about uh, some of the discussions around uh, identity and care uh, made earlier. Um, I think one of the issues is that a healthcare encounter is often kind of thought of as an isolated scenario where it's one person speaking to another person about their healthcare. Yeah. And in reality, that's not how it functions. You know, I, I work in, out of a healthcare clinic and I work with a, a social service office. And when you come in, you have to have concerns about the front end staff. You have to have concerns about lab technicians. You have to have concerns about every single person that makes up a part of one person's healthcare encounter. And so I think when you're talking about identity, pronouns, um, names that are not names given at birth, uh, that it's important to recognize that while you as an individual might think that you are taking care, even if you're not asking about pronouns, if, uh, if a client hears is misgendered or has the wrong pronoun used against them in that setting, um, it could be by someone who is not aware because it's not been made a part of that standardized process. And uh, just on a personal note, when those statements were made, it for me, it made me completely shut off for most of the rest of the conversation. And if that happens to someone in a healthcare encounter, especially when it comes to substance abuse, they may never come back to that clinic. They may never go back to medical care and they may start using again. And so how does that affect the overall health outcomes of that patient and your other patients of that population? Hi, if I could actually bounce off of that, because um, I was handed the microphone. <laughs> Um, I think it's great that so many organizations and institutions are adopting these LGBT friendly, you know, models of care or um, policies. Thank you. But I think often the policies um, don't get implemented all the way. You know, maybe not every single member of staff is agreeing to the policy, whether or not they have written in some kind of consent form that they have. You know, if I could share a personal anecdote to sort of um, shed some light on this, I have an experience in a doctor's office, a public hospital, um, with, you know, non-discriminatory clauses on the wall. And upon learning of LGBT status, the nurse who was seeing me um, felt it necessary to tell me she voted for Donald Trump. That was her response to that. Um, and, you know, regardless of your politics, I think it's common in many LGBT communities to find that kind of comment threatening. So regardless of these policies, you know, these kind of, um, that are me being made on the larger scale, you know, if they're not being implemented all the way down, you know, the intention is to reduce barriers to health care for LGBT populations. But in that moment, I mean, you can imagine, I never wanted to go back there again. I, so uh, what, what can be, I guess my question is what, is, what is being done or what can be done in these organizations and healthcare institutions where, you know, these policies aren't being implemented by everyone, even if they've signed, you know, some kind of consent to them? You, uh, you make, you both have made great points about there being a difference about the policy and how things are actually executed on the ground. I'll uh, actually turn it over to the panel to see whether you have any thoughts about how to match um, the actual frontline experience with what the, the uh, articulated core values and policies are of, of the institution. We, we, we really feel um, ac accountable to those we serve and to our employees to have a feedback loop that allows us to hear when we fail to deliver on our values and on our, on our policies. And sometimes there is, because of human beings, there is a discrepancy between policy and practice. And to the extent to which we tighten the feedback loop and get customer satisfaction survey, we have an, an ethics hotline so that people can call anonymously and deliver bad news to us about the performance of an employee or a, reveal a situation 
and then we take immediate action to understand fully the circumstances surrounding that encounter and hold people accountable accordingly. And so I think what you're speaking to also, which we haven't talked as much about today, but maybe it's been implied in everything, is the power imbalance that exists for this community and the importance of having a safe path to acknowledge when there has been additional marginalization through your experience. And so my encouragement and hope is that you felt comfortable, if not in that moment, in a subsequent moment, and it's not too late to do that today, to let that institution know about your experience and to expect some accountability around that. Fully, fully support that. Because we do have policies in place, but are they always followed by every staff member? Probably not, because I'm not watching every staff member 24-7. But if something is a concern, bring it up. Make somebody aware. You know, bring it to myself as the director. Or if I don't do anything about it, take it to the next level. My boss or my boss's boss. So making sure those things are brought to light so they can be addressed. Because that's, I think that's the key as well. Accountability, making sure we're connecting that loop. And then my job to make sure in my area that those things are being followed. Uh, and kind of having awareness of what's going on. Uh, so a, a number of factors from every individual and making sure we're keeping each other accountable and then we're, uh, we're following that up uh, so, so that they're held accountable. So we're at time. Uh, I, I, I regret we weren't able to get everyone's comments, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. Great job, great job, great job. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. This has been amazing. Let me just give you a, a little bit of instruction here in just a moment. Not yet, but in just a moment. Those of you who are leaving us for the day, we're sad. Um, we, we hope you stay. But if you have to leave us, would you exit through this right-hand door where Stacy is waving? Drop off your evaluation so we get your feedback and then make your way out. I don't know if it's raining or not. I haven't been out to see, but hopefully the, the weather has improved. If you're staying for the next session, we've got another great uh, conversation planned. We have lunch for you. So we're gonna ask you to use this left-hand door to get lunch. We have um, ham and turkey. We have some veggie sandwiches. We also have a few gluten-free options. If you've just been thinking about gluten-free, today is not the day to start because we only have enough for those <laughs> who are living the life of a gluten-free person. And so we will invite you to get those. And before we do that, I just want to ask you all to please join me. I mentioned her at the beginning of the hour, but really the work here at our Health Sciences Center is led by the amazing Stacy Steinbach. She's a wonderful addition to our community. <laughs> and we appreciate Stacy's leadership so much. This is how dedicated she is, you all. We're all going to rest after this. Stacy's going to go train all afternoon because that's just how devoted she is. So we appreciate you, Stacy. Okay, so everybody know what they're doing? If you're eating lunch or leaving? All right. We'll start again at noon.